read our rules for the meeting. Yeah, so thank you everyone for attending the Transportation Advisory Board meeting. To strike a balance between meaningful, transparent engagement and online security, the following rules will be applied for this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions will be limited to three minutes. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers or presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The Q&A function is enabled and it will be used for individuals to communicate with the host. It should only be used for technical online platform related questions and only the host and individuals designated by the host will be, will be permitted to share their screens during this meeting. Great, thanks Sydney. Uh, next on the agenda, we have approval of um, the August minutes. Does anybody have any edits or comments on the August minutes? All right, um, is there a motion to approve the minutes then? I move to approve. Thanks, Trini. Second. All in favor? All right. Um, by a unanimous vote, we approve the August minutes. Thank you. And then uh, next up, we have um, public comments. Um, for those of you who would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand, and Sydney will call on you. All right, it looks like Lynn, um, I'm going to unmute you and you can uh, unmute Why yourself. And then on? Why couldn't I get on? Why couldn't I get on? Can you hear me? Yes, we, yes, can, Lynn, hear we can hear you. Why could I not get on? Why I don't know, but you're on now. Go ahead, go ahead, Lynn. But the question is, why could I not get on? We don't know. I had to go through browser. I had to go through a whole bunch of things. Why? That's taking away from my time right now. I guess it's nice you don't have to hear anything from me, but there are problems with your system. And I'm asking why I couldn't get on. With all the other city meetings, I click and I'm on. Yours, it said go to browser, then go to another thing, then enter in this way. Why was that problem? Lynn, I'm <laughs> sorry. This is Tila. I'm not trying to interfere with your time, but we can hear you now. We're not aware of any problem uh, hearing you. So go ahead. Yes, but I'm concerned about how I get on to the meetings. I'm more I'm, concerned about the process than I am about all the problems with congestion in Boulder and all the problems with the potholes and all the threats of me to my bike when, when I'm 70 years old and trying to drive around and go past the Whittier neighborhood with, with crossing streets all over the place to get around all the construction all over town and the huge potholes that are very dangerous to bikes. That's what I want to be talking about, but instead I have to talk about the process. So how do I get on easily? Can you please help me? Lynn, to not take away from your time, this is Natalie Stifler, the Director of Transportation Mobility. You can reach out to me directly after the meeting and uh, we can help troubleshoot for you. Let's just do it right now, Natalie. I don't know. I don't have the answer, I'm sorry. Well, I don't know either, and I need to be able to get onto these meetings. At planning board last week, I was two minutes late, and that cost me my open comment. So that's a problem for me. And I was able to get on. I just came in two minutes late, and they hadn't played the stuff that warns people about how they need to testify first, or else I would have been able to get on and could have been two minutes late. 
So this time I got here on time, but I can't get here. I can't get on the system. If it's something at my end, tell me about it. I don't have time to deal with it ne later, Natalie. I've got the siding falling off of my house. I've got plenty of other issues. And I'd like to be able to testify at TAB without interference from even being able to log on. So you listen to nothing. That's what you get from your public. Hope you're happy. That's the remainder of your time. Is there anyone else that would like to speak during public comment? I just would like to say thank you, Natalie, for offering to help. That was very kind of you. Yeah, thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Lynn. Um, if we don't have um, anybody else, we will go ahead and move on to our um, next item on the agenda. Right over on the other side. Uh, so our next item is um, a staff update and have feedback on um, the Chautauqua Access Management Plan or CAMP ordinance updates. Um, so I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Me too. There we go. Thank you, Becky. Uh, my name is Chris Haglin. I'm principal planner with the Transportation and Mobility Department here to give an update on the Chautauqua Access Management Program. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Devin Joslin of the Transportation Mobility Department, the ops team, and Sam Bromberg of Community Vitality. Uh, Frances Bolding, I'm not sure if she's on. She wasn't on when I just... Uh, shared my screen, but she is also on the project management team from Open Space and Mountain Parks. Uh, I think it's very important to acknowledge uh, that this evaluation is a multi-departmental effort uh, under the AMPS umbrella or the Access Management and Parking Strategy umbrella of programs, which is a, a set of programs that, that we do uh, across the city with multiple departments to look at how do we manage access and, and develop innovative parking strategies. AMPS is one of the, the many guiding documents uh, that affects our work. Uh, you've seen some recent projects under AMPS, such as the performance-based pricing and the curbside management program. And CAMP is just another one of these uh, projects. So uh, just like to acknowledge the, the great support we have from multiple departments uh, across the city on working on programs like that. I'd also like to acknowledge the support and guidance of our leadership team, our directors uh, from Open Space, uh, Dan Burke, uh, Natalie Stifler, and also Valerie Watson from Transportation Mobility, and Chris Jones from Community Vitality. Uh, they've been integral throughout the, the evaluation of providing guidance uh, and support to the project team. CAMP was initiated initially in 2017 and really to manage parking demand around the park and how it affected the neighborhood to the north. Um, after the pilot year and the first full year, uh, an ordinance was created to run this program until uh, 2023. And then staff was directed by council to uh, reevaluate the program and, and present a recommendation to council on whether or not to continue uh, the camp program. The purpose of the evaluation project is to evaluate the camp program compared to the original goals of managing parking demand and also improving uh, livability in the neighborhood to the north. Um, the purpose is really to develop a staff recommendation based on data analysis and stakeholder input and provide those uh, that recommendations to boards and ultimately city council on whether or not to continue the camp program. And if we are to continue the camp program, what changes or modifications could we make to that program? 
Uh, if we are asked to continue the program and directed by council uh, following our October study session, uh, then we will need to do some ordinance updates as well. Uh, following those ordinance updates, uh, the project team can work on developing an implementation framework based on uh, council guidance, uh, and then also weave this into a, a larger, more holistic ongoing program uh, of trail access management, which is yet again under the AMPS umbrella. Um, the camp uh, program itself had many different elements uh, in order to manage that demand and increase livability. Uh, and it, it, it basically took place on the weekends and holidays between Memorial Day and Labor Day. And it, what we did is we started to have managed and paid parking at Chautauqua. We established a neighborhood parking program in the uh, North Chautauqua neighborhood. Uh, because we're charging for parking, the city also created a free shuttle system from remote lots in partnership with BBSD and CU. Um, we also had a great partnership with Visit Boulder, uh, formerly the, the Boulder Visitors and Convention Bureau, uh, to run an ambassador program to help people coming to Chautauqua to uh, deal with uh, paying to park using the mobile apps, how to use the shuttle, the regulations around it during COVID, everything. Uh, we owe a lot of gratitude to Visit Boulder for helping make this program successful. We also developed a transportation demand program for the employers and employees uh, that actually work at Chautauqua on a day-to-day -day basis and, and during the summer, during the camp season. Uh, you know, while I mentioned that this is a multi-departmental effort, um, from community vitality, open space, and transportation mobility. We also had a number of key stakeholders uh, throughout the, the years of this project, uh, including the Colorado Chautauqua Association, Visit Boulder, as I mentioned, Via Mo Mobility, who provides the shuttle service, uh, CU and BBSD, who provide the remote lots, uh, the residents of the neighborhood to the north, all the park visitors, and then also those Chautauqua employees and employers from the uh, various uh, uh, businesses there, and including city staff who, who work at the park as well. Um, basically, what we've seen in terms of visitation to the Chautauqua trailheads uh, is that it's been fairly stable since 2019. Um, and basically, what we do see is that uh, between the months of April to October, is where we see uh, average daily visits of over a thousand uh, people to the park. Of course, the highest months uh, of visitation are under the current camp season from that Memorial Day to, to Labor Day. Uh, today, most of the visitors that we're seeing at the Chautauqua Trailhead uh, are uh, residents of Boulder. Uh, and the most frequent days of visitation are on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, to this day, uh, the majority of visitors do arrive by vehicle, uh, but we do have about one in four arrive by bike or by foot. The Park to Park Shuttle, which was the official name of the, of the free shuttle from the remote lots at CU and BBSD, um, we, we saw a tremendous ridership at the, at the beginning of the program. Uh, that really was uh, impacted by COVID. Uh, and we are starting to see it rise again uh, after COVID, but we're still seeing that it's it's still about half of what it was uh, in it in the early years of the camp program. So we're still seeing a, a rebound of, of the use of that shuttle. Uh, over the same time, the shuttle operational costs increased by about 22 percent. But uh, because of some reductions in the rental costs of those remote lots, the overall cost of the camp project to operate has only really increased by 7% in terms of shuttle operation. In terms of parking management, we, we saw many key findings. Uh, just for a little background, uh, the, the price for parking at Chautauqua and, and in the neighborhood uh, in the NPP is $2.50 per hour. Uh, today, we are seeing most uh, people are using the Park Mobile app. Um, in general, we see uh, the ranger lot and the parking spaces along baseline completely fill at most times during the camp season. 
uh, we see uh, lower utilization at the Chautauqua Green and also at the McClintock uh, lots. Tila, yes, you had a question? Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, I was looking at the 250 an hour. I remember when we were, after the first two or three years of this, we were talking about maybe having parking at a lower base rate and then increasing it for longer stays. Was there a, a conscious decision to abandon that idea? And then um, is there, through the park mobile, is there a um, cutoff period? Is there a maximum parking time? Yeah, um, I just to answer the the la latter part. There is no maximum parking time. People can park as long as they want. That was an issue we resolved very early on because many of the climbing groups, as, as one example, are, are there for long periods of time. So there is no time limitation. Um, we did not, uh, over the course of the of the project, change uh, the parking in terms of any graduated pricing uh, over time. Uh, although one of the considerations, as you know from the memo, is that you know whether or not we should uh, implement performance-based pricing at Chautauqua to raise pricing on those higher utilized things. So that may be uh, another path to the same thing to help better manage demand. You're welcome. Um, typically we see parking sessions last between two to three hours. Uh, one thing that's important to note and it was in the memo is that the, the parking revenue, uh, which in the 2022 was $170,000, uh, more than covers the cost of providing the shuttle operational service and the renting of the lots, and even covers the extra cost of enforcement uh, because we are having people work on weekends and holidays, there is an additional cost to that parking enforcement. Uh, but we're pleased to, to know that the, the revenue from parking and from citations combined uh, exceed the costs to operate the program. Uh, in terms of the NPP in North Chautauqua, uh, the parking permits are $10 per camp season. Uh, and then also starting in 2022, uh, we also sold visitor permits to those residents for $5 each. As you can see, uh, the, the resident permits and visitor permits have de declined a bit, but generally remain uh, pretty stable. In terms of utilization uh, along baseline and along the, the, the streets in the neighborhood that are directly across from the main entrance, uh, that's where we see the highest utilization uh, during uh, the camp season. Um, but overall, there is still availability uh, during the camp season uh, on many of the uh, blocks in the residential uh, area. In terms of the TDM programs, we work with the, the dining hall and the Colorado Music Association and the Colorado Chautauqua Association themselves uh, to develop some TDM programs. Um, there, is, there are uh, employer-provided parking passes, although the amount of parking available to employees at Chautauqua is, is lower than the number of, of employees that are typically working there uh, on a weekend during the camp season. Um, so we do see some people still parking in other areas or using other modes of transportation. Uh, there were, uh, in addition to the uh, employer-provided uh, parking passes, Parking cash out benefits were provided, carpool benefits, uh, a telework option, and secure bicycle parking. Uh, when meeting with the employers uh, and talking through, uh, every employer said, yes, camp should be continued. What they would like to see is that camp, the camp season be extended in terms of the months uh, and possibly days of operation. Uh, most of all, I think they would really like to see direct transit access to Chautauqua, especially for their employees, uh, to provide them an alternative to having to arrive by automobile. Um, they would also like to see some additional opportunities for, for uh, parking permits in the neighborhood for employees. Uh, and in general, uh, they're very excited about some future uh, developments in terms of micromobility access uh, to Chautauqua. In terms of employee travel behavior, um, just like in the city of Boulder in general, less than half of the employees are Boulder residents. Um, we are seeing about half of the employees who work at Chautauqua do drive alone and about a quarter carpool. Uh, we do have some 
that also walk and bike. These are mostly uh, musicians from the Colorado Music Festival, since they are housed with families, oftentimes in nearby areas. Uh, most who drive uh, are able to, to park at Chautauqua with a parking pass, but there's still a quarter of those that drive that do uh, park for free in the surrounding neighborhoods. So meaning that they are parking beyond uh, the neighborhood parking permit area. Um, we we did uh, do some questionnaires with the, uh, the residents of the NPP. Um, oh, sorry, have that an NP, but it's NPP. Um, basically, uh, those the respondents to the questionnaire said, yes, uh, they do purchase uh, permits. Uh, they, in general, find it easier to park and that livability has increased during the camp season. I think the issue they have is that outside of the camp season, uh, really on those shoulders is where they see uh, the issues uh, of livability and, and parking management uh, impacting them. Um, and that that's because at the, you know, outside that camp season is when it's a free for all for parking in those neighborhoods. So uh, most, would, most of those residents want uh, camp to continue. Um, and they also wanted to see it expanded in terms of the months of the year and possibly even days of the week. Uh, most Mostly Friday is the big day or any day that there's a major event at Chautauqua. Uh, they also would like to see more uh, electric shuttles uh, used uh, in order to cut down noise within the neighborhood. Um, uh, also, half of the respondents said they'd be willing to pay more for their MPP permits if these changes could be made in terms of expanding the season and expanding the parking, the paid and parking enforcement period. Uh, we also did a general public questionnaire on Be Heard Boulder, and we had uh, QR codes throughout Chautauqua and on the shuttles and on the hop to Chautauqua. And so we did get a, a number of uh, respondents to that questionnaire. Uh, most of the respondents to that questionnaire are residents of the city or the county. Uh, and they generally come about 10 times a year to Chautauqua. Um, uh, about half reported driving to Chautauqua in some way and 17-18% uh, used either the hop to Chautauqua or the park to park shuttle. And I think the high, the high numbers of this is that the QR codes were in the shuttle and so we had a lot of respondents who are actually sh shuttle users compared to the open space data uh, that is looking at uh, just all visitors in general. Uh, those who responded to the general public questionnaire uh, who, who do drive, most of them do park at Chautauqua or in the MPP and pay for parking, uh, but also a good portion of them also try and find free parking uh, in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, in general, uh, most people said that the, the city charging for parking has not changed the frequency of their visitation, uh, but there are a portion that say that they in general visit Chautauqua less and typically it's about the level of crowdedness uh, and the difficulty in finding parking, not necessarily having to pay for it. Uh, in addition, those that use the shuttle um, rate it very highly in terms of the service. Uh, most of the respondents did wanna see the shuttle service expanded uh, and the uh, frequency of the shuttle service also improved and the use of electric shuttles. Uh, the, va the, very, the vast majority of respondents also said that they want camp to continue, uh, but they would like to see some modifications. Uh, the number one of providing direct transit access to Chautauqua, also expanding the camp season again to that April, October timeframe, uh, using the electric shuttles and even thinking about uh, possibly the Friday or event days as well for expanding service. Um, we also worked with uh, our race, racial equity team uh, throughout this whole evaluation process, working with that team and, and getting input from our community connectors. Uh, our surveys were available in English and Spanish, and we did some special outreach uh, so to some different groups who are uh, in the outdoors arena. Uh, we also have one more event, the Fiesta um, Festival del Sol coming up where we're going to continue to do some, some outreach there at Chautauqua. Um, 
The majority of, of visitors who respond to the survey who are non-white uh, are Boulder residents. They generally uh, come two to five times a year. The majority do arrive in car and mostly in groups. It's a group activity. Um, and about one in five said they have used the park to park uh, or hop to Chautauqua uh, shuttle at some point. Um, really, the having to pay for parking has has not in general impacted the frequency of their visitations. Again, like the general public survey, it is uh, crowds and the difficulty in finding parking, not necessarily having to pay for it. There is a high desire to continue camp. And again, the central themes of expanding camp uh, by month uh, and providing direct transit service, they were also very keen on uh, providing micromobility access uh, via B-cycle or Lime scooters. So that kind of goes over kind of the data and the input that we received uh, from our stakeholders and from our questionnaires. So based on that input uh, and the data analysis, staff you know, essentially comes up with two scenarios. One is discontinue camp and the other is to continue camp. Uh, with some of the anticipated changes that we see that we we know that are going to happen, and then with some possible minor modifications. Uh, the staff recommendation is to continue camp, uh, knowing that we're going to have some of these anticipated changes, and then we would certainly like the board's input and ultimately council's input on some of these possible modifications. Uh, in terms of those anticipated changes, we're looking at uh, providing Lime scooter access and dedicated Lime uh, scooter parking, AKA Lime Groves at Chautauqua. Uh, I think we have one uh, area identified right now for a Lime Grove, but we probably think we need at least two. Uh, we are looking forward to a permanent B-cycle station at Chautauqua. Uh, one that is by located by the dining hall was recently approved by Landmarks. Uh, so we're just gonna work with B-cycle on getting that station up and running. Uh, we also may consider some changes to the hop to Chautauqua route, given that we've had some uh, interesting developments that may want to we may want to hit, such as like the CU uh, hotel and conference uh, center there. Um, we will be doing some updates to the parking signage to to improve clarity. Uh, as well. And then we do have another issue that we may have to deal with, uh, and that is that uh, there is some construction at New Vista High School that is scheduled for 2024, which may impact our access to the lots. Something we've an eye on and, and continue to work with our partners over uh, B, BBSD. Um, some of the possible modifications to the program uh, that we could consider uh, as we move forward with CAMP is the implementation of pricing. Well, this is similar to uh, what we are doing in our other managed parking areas where based on parking utilization, uh, the A raised in increments of 50 cents uh, in those highest demand areas. We also uh, are looking at the of being a commuter permit parking program for employees in the North Chautauqua neighborhood, given that many of the blocks are underutilized during the camp and provide uh, some closer parking for those employees that do have to drive since there really is no direct transit access and uh, topography makes it difficult and challenging for some to reach it by other modes uh, than driving. Uh, one of the other interesting things we could do knowing that we have uh, uh, revenue that ex exceeds our operational costs is how can we reinvest that revenue uh, into some additional TDM benefits for those Chautauqua employees. One of the uh, the larger um, questions that we have is kind of beyond moving beyond uh, the current camp model and doing research on uh, how how can we, under kind of a trailhead access management program and the AMPS umbrella, look at a new way of providing access to Chautauqua um, that goes beyond that park and ride model? Essentially, the park and ride model and the use of the CU and BVSD lots kind of put some constraints on us on our ability to expand the camp season by month or by day of year. Uh, why we have access to those lots during the, the summertime on the weekends, 
having access to those lots are, is going to be difficult if we were tr going to try to expand. So one of the ideas that staff uh, would like to get the board's input on is uh, basically uh, giving support for uh, a future project to really uh, do a feasibility study, moving beyond that park and ride model, and how can we provide direct transit or micro transit access to Chautauqua. This would enable us to expand the camp season and our parking management strategies uh, and to possibly serve more destinations. Uh, we see trailhead access as, as a new uh, work program within and in partner possible in partnership with Boulder County. They also already are running the Eldo shuttle and the Hesse shuttle. So how could we uh, work with them and coordinate with them to create this more holistic uh, program? Uh, to provide direct transit access. Um, we also want to look at the use of the parking and citation revenue to fund this micro transit uh, efforts. So we would really need to connect, uh, conduct a, a larger financial analysis, really looking at the Is any cost of everyone... Are we good? We, Sorry, we lost I, you, you were frozen for, for me for a second. Thirty seconds, yeah. Yeah, okay. we lost you for a couple of minutes. Oh, for a couple minutes? About thirty, 30 seconds. seconds. Forty five oh, seconds, seconds yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, should I start back at this slide? I think you were on. Um, you got. Yeah. You got to more destinations, serving more destinations. You covered that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think I was I was going to talk about the um, the the use of the parking and citation revenue to fund uh, this new model of direct micro transit service. Uh, we know if we currently uh, the parking revenue uh, exceeds the operational cost. If we were to expand it, that means there would be additional revenue. Uh, but we'd have to do a feasibility study to see uh, what type of direct microtransit or transit service we could provide to Chautauqua and have it pay be paid for through that parking revenue. Um, there's also been a lot of interest uh, in expanding shuttle service up to flags out. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, so in general, what staff is requesting from TAB is feedback on the CAMP program in terms of staff's recommendation to continue uh, CAMP, uh, knowing that there are some anticipated changes and some po uh, potential modifications to the program uh, and the future analysis to move beyond the park and ride model uh, as well. So we're essentially asked on um, the recommendation to continue and also to do future work to have a holistic feasibility study looking at providing direct transit access to Chautauqua. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, Tila, do you have a question or feedback? Thank you, Becky. Yeah, um, Chris, this was lovely. Uh, I'm really happy to see that every time we come back and study camp, we are getting more and more positive feedback, um, um, particularly from the residents, but also this time seems much more from the users that people are finding it um, feasible, usable, um, helpful. I love the data that people are doing it in groups as a group activity. Um, one question I had was when residents were uh, in the area, in the camp area, were supporting continuing and saying that they would potentially pay more if we did X, Y, Z and all the X, Y, Z and Zs made sense to me. What are they paying now? And do we have a sense of how much more they would want to pay or be willing to pay? Yeah. So right now they are paying $10 uh, for the camp season for their permit. So Freaking bargain. <laughs> it, it is a low cost program. And then they are. My many notes pay. about underpriced parking in the NPPs. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. You were about to say. Yeah. So so it is just $10. Uh, we did not. Uh, 
Oh, darn, I've lost you. Uh, ask you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. You did not advertise, maybe? You did not? Um, we did not ask them if or or how much more they would be willing to pay. Sure. We just asked, would they be willing to pay more? Sure. That's perfectly fair. Um, and then in terms of expanding, one question that I had kind of looking at this ahead of time, um, I know that we had to do camp uh, on, it's not quite emergency, but there were some like temporary alterations to the city code about parking near trailheads because, um, you know, 30 years ago, roughly, and a different kind of line of thinking ago, a, a city council decades ago said, but kind of made a decision that people should not be charged for accessing these public lands. And I definitely understand the rationale behind that. But at the same time, we, in the meantime, as a, a society have learned that people who park for free um, are imposing a kind of cost to society that perhaps can be reflected in this kind of short-term parking access that camp represents. And so I guess my other question is, has the relative success, popularity, and support of camp um, made staff and or council and or the city manager's office more amenable to parking, pricing for access around trailheads in places other than camp. Um, bearing in mind that Chautauqua is by and large the biggest one, but last time we talked about this, mm -hmm. we also talked about Sanitas and there are other ones. There's Flagstaff, mm -hmm. there's no places. So has staff learned enough to sort of um, in, in advise council or advise the city manager's office that we ought to be looking at better parking pricing and parking management? at other trailheads. Yeah, well, I think that would be part of, you know, this kind of new program of the trailhead access management program under the AMPS of taking that holistic look. I would say that from, you know, staff's perspective that we see that uh, charging for parking is an effective means of managing demand. Um, you know, we have not gotten, I don't think direct uh, communication from from council or the city manager's office of of their desire to continue that or to expand that, but I think this is kind of the purpose of this evaluation is to for staff just to recommend to them that yes, this is an effective means of managing demand. Um, we also heard from the public that uh, having to pay for parking is not. Uh, you know, what impacts their frequency of visitation. It was right. really the being too crowded and the difficulty in finding parking, not paying for it. So I think that also shows support for that. But uh, but I'm not aware of any, you know, uh, conversations at the higher level about, about it. But that certainly will be, you know, part of the study session with council in October is uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of, of charging for parking to manage demand. Terrific, thank you. Thanks, Tila. Uh, Ryan, I saw your hand next. Thanks, um, Becky. I have a couple of questions and comments. Should I do the, all of that together or should I just do the questions first? So you're asking me? Um, yeah, sure, yeah. Pr procedure, oh, should I do the questions, <laughs> my questions and then you make my comments or are we just doing questions first? I I think we can do both since this isn't an item we yeah. vote on. Is that right, Meredith? Does it? Okay. Yeah, yeah I think you can. Vote. Okay, great. I'll fine. I'll I'll just proceed. I just have two questions. Chris, thanks. This is this is great and it's exciting. Um, I have two questions. You mentioned early on in the slides something about ordinance changes that you'd be yeah. potentially pursuing ordinance changes. Can you see more? Say more about that. What would they be? Or, or, yeah. Sure. So essentially the, the ordinance that would need to be updated is the ordinance that allows us to manage and charge for parking uh, at Chautauqua. Um, 
it is what we would need to update in terms of the ordinance itself is really um, eliminating the the sunset date. Uh, so our rec the recommendation from our city attorney's office would to have no sunset date. If council directs us to continue camp, it would be uh, continued and there there wouldn't be another sunset and another evaluation that we would have to go through. Instead, it would just uh, happen in perpetuity until they you know, chose to chose to do it. Most of the operational details of camp really occur in the city manager rules uh, in terms of, you know, what are actually the components that we're providing uh, since the ordinance is really focused on uh, the parking management uh, at Chautauqua and the, and the charging for parking. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then my second question is, um, I think I'm a, a big fan of, of going forward uh, and expanding, but I'd like to ask to be thorough um, on the recommendation, the staff recommendation to continue. Um, can you just give some kind of a sort of plus minus uh, pros and cons? Like what would, what would, you know, if, if what, what would the case, for example, of, of not going forward, of discontinuing? Yeah, sure. What would that be like? Yeah, I, I think if if we were to discontinue this program, um, I think uh, ending having to pay to park in both at both Chautauqua and the neighborhood would have significant uh, negative impacts uh, at, at Chautauqua and the neighborhood in terms of of the the demand uh, for parking, uh, and that's what really created the livability issues. Uh, and the issues for, you know, the people who work at Chautauqua as well um, that called for camp in the first place. It, it ultimately was how do we manage demand to to in, increase livability uh, in the area because of the, the number of vehicle trips that were being generated. And so I think if we discontinue it, we're going to see that parking demand increase and increase and we'll have the, the livability issues. Uh, in the neighborhood. So I think that would be the number one uh, impact that we'd see. We'll, we'll, we'd be right back to where we were in 27, 2016, 2017, when we started uh, trying to address the that issue. Thank you for that. And then a follow-up question by Atila in the chat is, um, can you just say more about the sunset date? What, what does that mean? And then let's see. And then so it, the, the current ordinance <clears throat> says that the Chautauqua program if we don't do anything, the Chautauqua program would end at the end of this year. The ordinances that allow us to charge for parking at the park uh, sunset on December 31st, uh, 2023. So um, the, the actual ordinance change, if, if council directs us to continue camp, the actual ordinance change is fairly straightforward and simple. It's, it's really getting rid of the sunset date. Uh, and then in terms of any operational changes we would make based on some of those, uh, you know, anticipated changes and the potential modifications, that's where, you know, that those changes would occur in the city manager rules. Thank you, Chris. Teal, are you satisfied or do you want to add? Oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to point out, I, I absolutely everything Chris said was correct. Uh, it's just that because there's sort of a baseline assumption in our... Uh, like municipal ordinances that the public has free, open, unfettered access to um, areas around, specifically around trailheads. Um, that camp was enacted and had been re-authorized, uh, I think twice. Uh, so it was like a pilot program and then a pilot yeah. program and then a pilot program. I think this is its third iteration. But because it was always a pilot program with an exception to that kind of like everybody can drive up for free and park as close as they possibly can, um, uh, it was enacted as like a test pilot that had an end date. And so what Chris is saying is that the staff recommendation is to say this is successful enough that we don't have to treat it as a pilot anymore. And that's why he's saying we would just remove the, the yeah. sunset. Um, that was That's the period at which the pilot would end. And so it seems like staff is recommending, uh, we just say, this has been successful enough. We're going to proceed 
um, sort of as is um, without having to re um, authorize this stuff year after year. That does not mean we can't continue to tinker with it, but it means we can stop reauthorizing it every two or three years. Fair enough? Yeah. Yes, very fair. Okay, thanks Teal, thanks Chris. Um, Becky, can I, I'll make my comments now if that's okay? Okay, great. So um, on the question, question number one, Yes, I uh, I support make, moving forward, and also with Tila's helpful clarification, it sounds like to really emphasize that, or I guess to um, just clarify that this is to make it a full program. I mean, that sounds like that's maybe embedded in the mm -hmm. question. So, so I'm a yes on that. And then on question number two, I'm also a yes, and I'd like to say two things about that. Um, I, I'm really enthusiastic about um, the idea of serving more destinations and at least getting some analysis on what that might look like, financials, uh, and et cetera. I would be optimistic that um, something like this could be, we could do a lot with something like this in a, on an expanded basis that would be self-funding. And I would be really excited to see the horsepower of Chris, of your of, of um, your shop on this, what we could do through TDM. Um, I think it's really, I mean, I just feel like this is really this, like in a, like the spirit of Boulder is, is giving people ways to get around outside to outdoor destinations um, without having to drive a car. And um, I think it's consistent with the sustainability, equity, resilience framework. That's the kind of thing we should be moving towards. So I'm, I'm extremely excited about that. And um, I, you know, I, I sort of maybe have a, a, a dream that like, this is the beginning. Camp is the beginning of of some much much greater expanded um, version, or at least an exploration. Um, the other thing I would like to add is um, I, I'm great, grateful, Tila, for you clarifying the um, the sort of ordinance issues here. And I guess I would like to put some make sure we can sort of provide the feedback to council here is that um, you, you know we have. Some, some, sometimes the, the transportation projects can kind of come piecemeal. We make changes here and there, but when we make like a big package of things, that, that can be when we really get um, momentum. And I think CAM is an example of that, where there was a, you know, we got real sort of political momentum to move things forward. And so we're talking now about parking ordinance change. Um, we have a couple of other items today, I think both on our board matters, we're going to talk about parking ordinance changes. And um, I would be really excited about giving some kind of presentation to council that is about the, a package of parking reforms that could make this be something bigger than just camp, but like, you know, a, um, a, a strategic, some kind of a plan. And, you know, I, I've been, I'm just thinking that might include things like adding VMT reduction to ordinance as, as part of what, or, or mode shift and or vision zero. Um, but just being thoughtful about, we've got a, a number of things we went to council on ordinance changes ar around parking. Is there a way to package that as something bigger or at least like considerations for council to make as it goes forward? Um, so that's that's the end of my feedback, but I'll just conclude by saying thanks to Chris and team. I think this is really exciting. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Trini. Thank you. Um, so I kind of echo what Ryan's saying. I think it's super exciting to have more options and to expand the way we move around our city. And I was looking up the hop. Um, so Chris, there was already like a hop program that you like, I, I, I saw that it was hop to Chautauqua auditorium. Mm -hmm. um, would you guys be tapping into that again? Cause that, 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 seems like like a no-brainer to me um yeah for sure i you know i think you know one way you could look at, at the future expansion beyond that park and ride model is to think about taking the hop to chautauqua mm -hmm. model and and expanding it to serve more destinations more areas you know the hop to chautauqua is very effective at bringing people to the special events at chautauqua the music at chautauqua uh and so you could kind of perceive of this you know ex future exploration it's like how do we expand that hop to chautauqua program to provide that 
you know, frequent direct access to Chautauqua that would serve visitors, it would serve the employees, uh, and it would serve, um, you know, uh, help continually manage that parking demand at, at, at the park. Yeah, I think that would be great. And I just wanted to um, to say that I'm a huge fan of the of the um, B cycle station there as a permanent um, choice. Yeah. yeah, glad we got it through landmarks. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks, Trini. Um, I have a couple questions and comments. Um, I think on the first item, I'm you know, excited to see the success of this program and the positive feedback. That's great um, and supportive of continuation as well as the changes that have been proposed, um, the, the possible modifications, especially those that help um, employees working um, in the Chautauqua area. Um, so I don't have any, I don't think I have any questions on that first one, uh, but on the, on the second regarding expansion, um, I'm, I guess what I haven't quite figured out is like, I understand that the program has been popular and there's interest in expanding it, but um, I'm not sure. It seems like it's been successful. So I guess I'm not sure what sort of problem is like the expansion would be solving that hasn't been solved by the existing program and potentially it's modifications. Um, so I guess maybe I'll, I'll stop there yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what I think, you know, the main issue is that it has been successful, and, but it's been successful from Memorial Day to Labor Day um, on the shoulders of of the camp, what we call the camp season. Uh, you still have high visitation. Uh, and if you look at the Chautauqua Trailhead counts, I mean, that's where you're seeing that you know, although for sure the major the the highest months are, are June and July, but you still have over a thousand visitors per day in April and October and in May and in September. So, um, and that's where you know. So we're still seeing high demand, and once you know, right before the camp season begins and right under after the camp season uh, ends. On those shoulders, that's where you see, you know, the impact on the neighborhood in terms of the availability uh, of parking. Because, you know, before we're charging for parking, people are parking all over in the neighborhood, creating livability issues. And the same thing right after it ends, people no longer have to pay to park. And, you know, so I think the expansion is how we're still seeing high demand, uh, all basically April through October. So should we expand it to those months to carry, you know, to cover the highest demand thing, demand months? Uh, because, you know, during the winter time, you have much lower demand and you're not, you're not seeing those impacts on the neighborhood or the massive parking demand at the park itself. So I think that's the main thing it would solve is just, you know, kind of those shoulders, the issues on those shoulders of the season. Okay. Uh, thank you. That That's helpful. I guess I was, um, part of my kind of confusion about it was because if I, if I'm understanding and definitely correct me if I'm wrong, like the highest occupancy, for instance, in the neighborhood would be 70% of spots used, which still means that even at the highest point outside of the season, um, like there's still a, almost a third of parking spaces are open in the neighborhoods. Um, and well, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm su supportive of managing the parking and, you know, I, I'm not against paying charging for the parking at other times. Um, I'm wondering if an expansion, given the many, the different parts potentially in this expansion could get to a point where the, like including the shuttle and or expansion of transit service, I guess I'm wondering if it would get to a point where it would maybe help address some of that extra parking utilization, but would might also lose the fact that it's currently covering its costs. Is that a risk that it wouldn't cover its costs with an expansion of the program? 
Yeah, well, I think we'll have to do a, you know, a full feasibility study of that um, and also just look at the capacity of even providing the service with, with our current provider. Um, I think the, you know, what what we see in terms of the parking utilization in the MPP during the camp season, we see the lower utilization because we are charging to park. And so the issue is on those shoulders where you still have high demand at the park, but we're not charging park, then utilization really skyrockets in that surrounding area. So uh, what it shows of the kind of the overall 70%, you know, as you said, utilization, that's during the camp season. That just shows the effectiveness of, of charging for parking and, and managing that demand so that you can increase the livability in, in the community. But when, when you're not charging for it, then, then you see the utilization go up and the livability issues remain. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, I would be supportive if it didn't cost more, if it didn't result yeah. in a sort of cost, you know, expansion, um, because this kind of gets to something I was interested in our last meeting about, um, you might not have heard this, but about the East Aurora neighborhood parking program um mm -hmm. was that i'm i'm always i'm a little concerned when there's a lot of effort going into like one area in terms of city resources and time mm -hmm. if it doesn't benefit you know a large like when, when that could you know be benefiting another portion of the city and i understand yep. this is a the, the park is a resource that lots of people yep. use so it's not just the residents who benefit from this program but that's just kind of where i'm coming at where i'm weighing well what what is that sort of investment of city resources in doing more in this area versus other things you know on the very kind of full plate of items yeah. that that there are to work on and that's where i'm just not i'm not i'm not totally sure for instance providing more transit to help employees get there if most employees don't live in boulder then more local transit isn't going to help them um uh, it's just like those kinds of I know mm -hmm. that's where I'm kind of weighing. Yeah, no, how and much I, I support I, it. Yeah, I certainly understand that perspective. Um, I, I think you know, in general, since we're seeing that the revenue is covering the cost of providing uh, the shuttle, renting the lots, providing the extra parking enforcement, um, I, I would think that if we expanded the camp season and continue and manage parking for a much larger time frame uh, and still, you know, providing that service, uh, you know, whether it's on the weekends or, or expanded, I, I would think that managing the parking and the revenue from that, you know, likely would, would cover those operational costs. Uh, again, you know, not not for sure. We would, you know, that's part of that future research would be that feasibility study of, okay, if we were to provide this level of service, you know, what would be the estimated cost? And then if we were to expand the parking management uh, by this time frame, what do we anticipate the revenue to be knowing the levels of visitation that are happening? And that's why, you know, it's, to to do that it's it's gonna you know it, it wasn't really in the scope of this evaluation but uh it's it's a much larger project to to do that holistic feasibility study but i think we'll we'll likely find that that we're gonna be earning enough parking revenue that we should we should cover the costs um but we'll we'll have to really look at that okay thank you yeah but um I guess I, I would say my summary is like very supportive of number one, and I have some reservations about number two, both not just the program cost, but also just the cost of staff time given other department priorities. But um, I know you all have a much better view of that than I do. So um, yeah, so so that kind of sums up um, my comments. Uh, Tila, you had another um, comment? Tila, who are you? Uh, Trini, how about you go ahead? If well, I Tila back. Wanna, yeah, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to add about the hop. I mean, yeah, obviously it's local, but for people that are traveling from out of town, I mean, they can just go to the either to the central station in Boulder downtown, 
where they can go to Table Mesa and do a park and ride. Um, so I think it does kind of resolve issues, especially with the employees, because um, I've heard Chris mention time and time again that that is a really, really big problem for them, that there's really, mm -hmm. like, physically, there's not enough spaces for the employees that work there to park, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yes, correct. You know, the, the average daytime uh, workforce is is way more than the number of parking spaces that are available on site for them. Uh, mm -hmm. The employers have a, you know, they've each developed a system to divvy out uh, those parking spaces. But then, you know, a lot of employees are, are are left to to find other means, you know, not the easiest place to bike to. Uh, now with electric bikes, that's changing, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's why I think the B cycle is they're all very excited about the, the potential for a B cycle station. But, you know, uh, virtually all the respondents uh, who work at Chautauqua, in the summertime, they they would just really love to see direct transit access. Um, and even though, you know, uh, less than half live in the city, uh, it would still maybe provide the ability to take transit, you know, and, and get off it at Broadway and, and Baseline and, and take, you know, a, a bus the rest of the way up or from Table Mesa Park and Ride, for example. So I think it could also help those who don't live in Boulder. Yeah, and another thing I just wanted to like emphasize, I believe that, I mean, Chautauqua and not only the trails, but like the the amphitheater and the the diner and <clears throat> everything that Chautauqua has to offer, I believe it's like one of our biggest tourist attractions, right? Yep. I mean, yep. so, Chautauqua and Pearl Street Mall. Yeah, so <laughs> we do want to make sure that people have a good way to get there and effective way to get there. So I am highly supportive. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, and, and that's why, you know, think about, uh, you know, this direct transit service also having stops at our, you know, our largest hotels uh, mm -hmm. for visitors, you know, a more direct access. Yeah. No, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Trini. And I, I agree, I would be very supportive of providing more transit access. I just would want to know that it's really... Transit access that would help. Transit access that would help, and I feel like a lot of times when I I would love to take a bus to some part of the city, and I live in in the city, of course, but like because I have to transfer buses, it'll take me an hour to go somewhere that is ten to fifteen minute drive, and then I'm not going to use a bus. So knowing like that it would be the route that would actually be in place would be valuable to employees. Would be much more like versus just the idea of more transit access, which I think we'd all love more transit access all the time. Um, but knowing it would, in fact, be an investment that would support that population is kind of where I'm, you know, I would just want to want to know that, that that would be worthwhile versus the many other areas we would like to invest in, you know, more transit access for reaching all sorts of. And I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I believe the hub doesn't really have that many stops. And adding one, I'm very familiar with that route. So going from like Euclid and and 16th, which is the other main where you, where you can transfer buses, just going up that 16th to baseline. I mean, I, I don't think it would be that problematic and they've already done it. So I mean, I'm not reinventing the wheel as they say, but, but yeah, I think it's a really easy fix. Like, I don't think they'd have to invest much, but anyway, that, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Trini. Uh, Tila, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I see your hand there. Yeah, I know. I got super frustrated. <laughs> I've uh, been having technical difficulties. So uh, one thing I was really curious about when Chris is talking about expanding the camp program on the shoulder seasons to address, let's say resident concerns about accessibility. Um, I don't know how to assess those resident concerns because of course those residents are living in a very desirable section of the city because they live next to this awesome place. <laughs> and so I have my own biases about how legitimate the concern is about others who wanna come from far away and can't do, I mean, 
I disagree with Chris saying it's not a very bikeable or not an easy place to bike to because uh, billions of people do bike there. But to the extent that that's correct and people feel that they need to drive there, especially if they're going in groups, um, I, I have trouble with crediting full force the people who live nearby within steps a five minute walk to say that other people are impeding their access to either their homes where they have one or two garage spaces or driveway spaces under city code um and so it feels a bit a bit like othering um I think that so far camp has been able to avoid some of that, but I guess my other question is, um, well, my main question is if we were to extend it to shoulder seasons, will we be looking at maybe altering and lowering the price uh, if we're trying to um, offer an on-ramp or an off-ramp to the demand, would we have our pricing reflect uh, slightly less or slightly more demand closer to the peak season or away from the peak season. Well, I think, you know, one of the questions that we, you know, wanted some feedback on is should the city implement their performance-based pricing program uh, to, you know, be consistent with our other managed areas so that those blocks that, are showing the highest demand, those that parking price would increase to continually help manage that demand. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why I asked about how this might relate to other trailheads. Like I'm I'm very cognizant of that. Um, and I think that's a good thing that you have in mind. I'm just kind of wondering how our actions and our pricing models are going to reflect that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's what we'll have to see. Uh, you know, in terms of visitation, I know, you know, Chautauqua is by far the number one visited area and probably Sanitas is number two. Uh, but there's not beyond those two trailheads. Uh, there's not, uh, you know, a number of other areas that have the huge uh, parking demand and then, you know, uh, the, you know, impacts on the neighborhoods in terms of livability. So uh, there may only be a couple other areas where we would consider uh, managing parking demand by pricing. Uh, I guess I'm I wondering think, what kind of impacts on livability you're talking about. You know, I think, you know, what what I've heard from the residents of North, North Chautauqua, and some of them are older homes that don't have driveways. Uh, that they are parking their their vehicles on the street. And if they leave on a weekend, you know, like on a Saturday morning to go do something, and when they come back, the, you know, they can't park anywhere near their home. So, you know, that that's usually what I hear. I also hear a lot of complaints that uh, people are blocking people's driveways. Uh, you know, so many cars are trying to park in those areas that they're consistently having their driveways blocked um by vehicles that are you know kind of wedge their their car into a, a space that's not big enough and so there's impeding access gotcha to yeah gotcha and, and i was wondering like are owners blocking their own driveways because that would be a, a way around it i'm just curious is there any sort of uh attempt to empirically verify these what oh. you're telling me is basically very um, a hearsay kind of there's a no, better word for it. it certainly is you know the the reports and the you know the complaints that we get and the you know the they said yes we want to form an NPP because uh, there are issues that are impacting their lives um, we have not you know gone out and done a you know we've done counts in terms of measuring utilization by block so, you know, we do have data on that of wh what blocks are the highest utilized at different times of the year outside and inside of the camp season. And so we do have empirical data on that. Okay, thank you. Can, can, can I add something? Um, I know from conversations or from, I just 
remember a lot of information that Chris shared when I did the bike tour with NACTO with him. And I mean, one thing that we do have to be cognizant of is that a lot of people that live around the, those neighborhoods are, are elderly citizens. So, um, so that's another thing to consider. I mean, I don't know that I'm sure that's really easy to have access to. Um, but yeah, I mean, then like Chris said, they leave, go out of town and then come back and can't have access to their homes. Sorry, I apologize for my dog. Thanks, Trini. Teal, I did have some some similar feelings to you looking at the survey data, um, mainly because, I mean, it wasn't a, a huge number of people, but those half of the people who responded said, um, well, a lot of people wanted it expanded. I think half said they didn't want to pay more um, for a permit, if I recall correctly. Yeah, so half said they'd be willing to pay more than $10 for a permit and half didn't. So I, I kind of got mixed messages. Like on the one hand, there's a lot of enthusiasm for expansion, but if only half of people are willing to pay more than $10 for a permit, that's like not sort of you know, not putting the money where the sentiment is and, you know, you pay for things you value. So I, I wasn't totally sold. You know, I think it's easy to say you want something when it's just going to be provided and it doesn't cost you anything more. Uh, I mean, I don't dispute real livability, some of these concerns that Chris cited, but I do think that the, some of the survey data, even, it was a small, again, a small sample, but it, that I think it does kind of, for me, raise questions over, you know, the real, um, need um, uh, that in addition to the you know a lot of times when parking is you know never never higher than 70 percent but often lower thank you becky i hadn't picked up on that that's great um, anyone else have any other questions or feedback okay well thank you so much chris all right Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your feedback. Okay. Great. Um, so our next item on the agenda is staff update and tab feedback on Colorado 7, um, Arapaho from 28th to 63rd Street. So I think we have um, Jean Sanson and also um, some folks from CDOT here to join us. So I'll turn it over to them. Hi, good evening, Tab, and thanks for having us this evening. I'm Jean Sanson, City of Boulder Transportation Planning, and I am joined by Mitch Beckett, who is the project manager for the CO7 Preliminary Engineering and Environmental Project, and Chris Proud um, with HDR, who is the consultant project manager on the project. So I'm just going to very briefly introduce the project and provide a little bit of context, much of which was in your memo. Um, but as many of you know, East Arapaho, Colorado 7 is a passion project for me. We have been working um, on plans and designs for this quarter for many years, uh, most notably the East Arapaho Transportation Plan, which we, the city adopted in 2018. 18, which really set the state, the vision concept of the East Arapaho tra Transportation Plan. And I think as, as most there's no, no um, the real frame is rapid transit. Hey, Jane, I don't know if everyone else is the same, but you are breaking up for me uh, for your audio. Yeah, I'm having trouble too. Okay. Um, I turned off my video and please interrupt me if I'm breaking up again. Okay. Um, what I was saying is that the framework for the East Arapaho transportation plan is um, really a multimodal concept whereby we introduce regional bus rapid transit, which is high frequency, um, high frequency transit between Boulder I-25 and Brighton, as well as many multimodal improvements, um, such as protected bicycle facilities and pedestrian facilities and landscape enhancements on the corridor itself. And what I wanna say here is that, you know, our segment of the Colorado 7 corridor, which is a 29 mile corridor, is the Western end of the corridor. And 
taken as one piece of a much larger initiative, which is part of the Colorado 7 Coalition made up of all the jurisdictions between Brighton and Boulder. When we think into the future of implementing all of these multimodal and safety improvements, we can expect to see pretty great regional benefits. And so CDOT has forecasted what some of those benefits might look like. Can you all still hear me? I got some feedback. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, you know, everything from, um, you know, a large order of magnitude and reduction of annual traffic cr crashes to um, redu reductions in vehicle miles traveled, um, and then resulting greenhouse gas emissions. And what's really exciting about um, this stage of where we are in preliminary engineering for this project specifically is that it's laying the foundation for a lot of work that's coming in the very near future. Everything from the multi-use path and transit stop project, which will go into construction next year, to um, the bus rapid transit starter service, which is expected to begin operations in 2026. Next slide, Chris. Um, so just a little bit of more context related to this project specifically. You know, it's very much built on the East Arapahoe Transportation Plan, which looks to address future existing and future transportation needs. You know, when we think about this part of town, it's an area that's transforming very quickly, as we know, as we adopted the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan, and we see a lot of land use changes happening out there um, almost daily. And so what we're doing um, in designing these multimodal improvements is designing improvements that work for the people who are there today, who are living and working in the quarter, and those who are work, living and working there in the future, not just within Boulder, but, but importantly for those commuters who are coming into town. How much nicer is this towel than this towel? Tila, I think, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so desired outcomes, um, very important. Um, obviously, we're looking at things like enhancing safety by providing a stronger multimodal network, looking to move people, um, which includes private vehicles, but really um, highlights all modes of travel in this corridor. And um, you know, by doing this, improving things like air quality and reductions on in our um, on climate impact. So. I am going to stop talking now, and I'm going to hand this over to Mitch and Chris, who are going to share the details of this project. And we really look forward, Tab, to hearing your input this evening. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jean. I appreciate that. Um, as Jean mentioned, my name is Chris Proud. I am a consultant. I'm working with CDOT and with our partner with the city of Boulder on this effort. Um, I will just note uh, before I get uh, dive into it here, I'm working on my laptop screen tonight. So forgive me. I can't kind of see everyone uh, in the video piece, etc. cetera. Um, so if, if I cut out or there are any problems, please just uh, chime in and let me know one way or another. But I'll open it up for the presentation and then hand it back to Mitch um, for some information here. But just to set things up for you all, um, we do want to thank you all first for the opportunity to come and present tonight and just give you information. And you actually uh, are the first group that we're working with, in, at least through this um, particular round of public engagement that we're going to be doing on the effort. So in essence, you're a little bit of a test for us to see how the questions and things go tonight, and we may shift some things up but we, uh, as we learn from, from talking with all of you. But as far as the presentation that we have, Mitch is going to present a little bit of context here to make sure that uh, we give you additional background. And I know many of you have been involved in working on this corridor for a very long time, so, so many of you are, are quite familiar, uh, but just to make sure that it's a level playing field for all. Then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about the different concepts that we're looking at as far as design is concerned, and we'll run through those options with you to make sure that you're clear on those. And then the final piece is really, uh, we have a series of questions that we'll go through at the end with you all and seek to get some feedback. So what we'd like to do, because we do have a, a fairly meaty presentation here, is to try and get through everything in the presentation, and then we'll deal with those questions and any clarifying things at the very end. And we can, of course, always slip back to any uh, slides that we need to that you might have questions on as we go through them. So. Mitch, I'm going to throw it over to you. Do you want to start with the context piece? And then same thing as Gene did, just tell me next slide and I'll advance for you when you're ready. Sure, I can do that. Can you hear me just fine? Got a thumbs up. Perfect. So 
Once again, my name is Mitch Beckett. I am the CDOT project manager for all things CO7. Um, and like Gene said, this is a uh, segment A that we're calling it is, is just one piece of the puzzle uh, for the entire corridor of CO7. Uh, this is a multi-agency, multi-region project uh, that was successful with the Dr. Cog TIP grant. And all of these projects are progressing to about 15% design. And so uh, this project goes all the way from Brighton uh, and extend all the way into Boulder. And how what you see on the screen is how this has been divided up into segments. We did uh, letters for segments A, B, and C, which are all in region four. And then uh, the segments from D to M are the segments that are in C dot region one. So this is a multi effort with a lot of individuals involved with local agencies from Brighton, Adams County, Thornton, uh, Broomfield, Erie, Lafayette, uh, Boulder County, and of course, the city of Boulder. Next slide. So to give a little bit of context of where we are in this project. So our project is going from that planning stage into that design phase. So uh, up until now, we've had the East Arapaho Transportation Plan that we're working on and building our efforts. And now our goal is to take that plan and kind of extend it and find the feasibility and make sure that we understand some of the constraints and make sure that we have a working plan in order to be able to progress our design. Uh, so we call it about the 5% design is where we initially started and trying to get this to that about 15% design in order to progress it in order to find additional funding for uh, design in the future, as well as uh, construction into the future as well. Next slide. So like I said, this is a very collaborative effort for segment A and we keep calling it segment A and the limits of segment A is from 28th Street to 63rd. So the areas that are inside of the city of Boulder uh, limits in particular. Um, there are a lot of different aspects for this project, which include the bicycle protective facilities as well as multimodal and transit. Uh, and so I'm trying to, uh, like Gene said, trying to move people in around the corridor uh, from the goods and services to bike and pedestrians um, and to progress that design to uh, to conceptual or even that 15% to plan sets in particular. Uh, this area is one of the most heavily travel traveled commuter corridors. Uh, we see that a lot of the ridership actually comes from Lafayette. Uh, so it's Lafayette in the AM and peak, AM, peak period periods. Um, and uh, our goal is to try to figure out how best to manage that heavily commuter traffic uh, for the future. Uh, this section is considered urban and is uh, considered congested in its current existing um, stage. Thanks, Chris. So uh, our project for the segment A kind of preliminary engineering is to advance the preliminary engineering design for a multimodal concept study um, like I said, from the East Arapaho Transportation Plan uh, and to address the existing and future transportation needs, local and regional, um, and to facilitate the safe travel and access. Like I said, bike, walking, biking, uh, transit, as well as driving for goods and services. Next slide. Uh, so there are a lot of near-term improvements that we're doing. So. Uh, specifically working with CDOT design uh, for the transit uh, incorporation into a resurfacing project that is scheduled for construction next year, so 2024. Um, and like Gene said, there is also the regional uh, transportation service, the regional transit service that is going to be designed in 2025 and operational in 2026. Um, like I said, it is regionally funded with multiple local agencies from Brighton to Boulder uh, and continuing that culture of transit in the corridor itself. Um, this is a ongoing collaboration with the CO7 coalition and all of the local agencies. Uh, we have meetings to, to give them uh, updates and uh, how the project is going uh, on a regular basis. And our goal is to continue that efforts and that design in place uh, phase. Next slide. 
Next, I'll kick it off to Chris to the, discuss some of the concept plans that we have going forward. Great. So Mitch and Gene teed it up a little bit here with some background, and hopefully that gives you at least a, a basic context kind of moving into um, our, our discussion of potential options. And, and what I want to give you a sense of first um, before we actually get into the details are just how we created those options and how we sort of compared and contrasted them against one another. And really, it's, it's certainly not a done deal at this point. I mean, we are still early in the process. And the whole idea is that we are, are going out to public engagement and talking with groups like yourselves to get feedback that's going to potentially influence how these designs are, are ultimately put together. Um, but We've mentioned multiple times, I think, that we're building on that past planning, particularly the East Arapaho Transportation Plan and the vision and the concepts that were included there. There's a whole host of other plans uh, that, that have been uh, examined and, and advanced along the corridor over the years as well that we're, we're making sure that we, we consider all of those as we've been putting options together. Um, I think one of the key things is that our job on the design side is to you know, take that vision and figure out how do we actually make that a reality. And, and I think you can understand that it, it's not always as simple as just, you know, saying, okay, this is exactly what we want here. It works on the ground. There's always constraints and challenges that we're going to deal with. But one of the key tenants going into this is really making sure that all of those essential mobility elements that have been identified in East Arapaho and, and other plans, the transit component, the bike component, the, ped com the pedestrian component, um, roadway, goods movement, all of those things, that in whatever options we put forward, we're making sure that all of those things are included in a, a safe and comfortable way as well. So that's really one of our basic tenants. Um, but I, I think I kind of said this before, we're, we're making sure to refine the multimodal concepts that came out of the past plans to make sure that they fit and work on the ground. A couple other things that we're working on simultaneously is to really kind of understand what are the space needs that we have to incorporate this? And does it go outside of either the, the property that CDOT has or the potential for easements beyond that? Um, and so would there be the need for, for property acquisition in order to make some of these things happen? And then finally, what's the overall cost? And uh, as best we can estimate the cost at this sort of early 15% design level. Um, now, we are also looking at these options and trying to make sure that we're, we're considering them from a variety of different perspectives, and it's really kind of an iterative process. We, we do some work, we get some feedback, we tweak it, and, and so on. But we're thinking about things clearly like safety, maintenance, bike comfort and safety, pedestrian comfort and safety, environmental, um, the BRT and, and the bus operations and how that would work on the corridor. So all of those things have to go into our thinking as we're pulling these designs together. So what I'd like to do now is move into the actual options. And we kind of have four, I guess, five actually of uh, slides here that, that I'm going to step through. And I'll probably spend a little bit more time on this very first one just to make sure that the elements of it are actually clear. And then you'll see when we get to some of these others after this, that they're actually all quite similar. They're just slight variations in them that I'll be pointing out to you. But we wanted to take you through each of them just to be you know, completely transparent here as to, to what we're looking at and what we're putting together. Um, and I know most of you are quite familiar with, with Arapaho uh, and really thinking about 55th, it, it's, it's, it, sort of a different setup from 55th to the east and 55th to the west. So our options actually reflect that here. We have sort of different uh, amount of space. We have different lane configurations. And 55th is somewhat of that dividing line. Um, so we elected to use that and develop different options, either east or west of 55th. So there's a very first one that we're looking at is actually west of 55th. And what you see here, I'm just going to kind of walk through, this is clearly a cross section, and I know you all deal with this, with transportation stuff all the time, but it's, you know, basically just like a cut if we're standing in the street and looking at what this, the elements that would be included here. And you can see west of 55th, we do currently have three travel lanes in each direction, and you can see that we are repurposing one of those travel lanes for BRT, or in this case, what we call BAT or business access and transit lanes. Um, then this this actual this cross section is actually probably most similar to um, uh, the the East Arapaho transportation. <coughs> pardon me, East Arapaho transportation plan um, information that uh, you all are, are quite familiar with as well. 
But then I'll talk a little bit about those the space sort of outside of the 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 travel lanes themselves and this kind of behind the curb element. And what you're looking at here is um, where this light pole is, and hopefully you guys can see my uh, cursor here moving. There's a bit of separation between the the bus access and transit lane. Then there's the raised protected bike lane uh, that's located there. Then there's a landscape or, or an amenity zone, as we call it, which could be landscaping, it could be benches, it could be a variety of different things. But it does also then uh, separate from uh, a multi-use path. And that would is mirrored on both sides. But in essence, it is very similar to, to what was put forward in the East Arapaho Transportation Plan. And it really is focused on you know creating safe space for all users, whether that's the transit component, the bike, the ped, or even the roadway users, and that we have the ability to do that. Um, some of the differences here that you'll see as we, we move into it is the location of this amenity zone. Uh, it'll shift around, you'll see in later slides, but right now it is between this uh, race protected bike lane and the multi-use path. Now, there's some benefits I would say to that, and we're gonna ask you for your feedback in a little bit here on, the, on that configuration. But one of the challenges it does present for us, and we have to think about every aspect of this, but from a maintenance perspective, uh, as we clear snow off the road from this, um, uh, from the bat lane or the, the BRT lane, the snow storage could possibly move into the bike lane, which we would then have to, to clear. Uh, and that we would have to clear the bike and the multi-use path separately. So it's not a fatal flaw, I would say, but it's just something to be aware of that there is additional maintenance that we would need to consider along these. It is overall kind of the widest option that we have. So where we have the space to achieve this, where we would really be looking uh, to advance this as it is the, uh, the, the uh, vision that came out of past planning. So let me move on to um, e Chris, oh, sure. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, uh, Tila no, has a here. question, I think. Yeah, thank you, uh, Becky. Uh, so my my main question is, uh, I understand you're here as an information item tonight. You're not asking for any action by tab. What What's the plan going forward for us um, to be commenting on these plans? Like, I appreciate you walking through this stuff, but if we have actually substantive feedback, what is the timeline or process for us doing that? Yeah, no, it's a it's a, a good point. So um, I do have a slide a little bit later just to kind of talk about the the public engagement and the cadence of that as well. So again, tonight you're right. It's uh for it, for you all. This is an informational piece, and we want to make sure you're fully up to speed and understand what we're putting together. Um, there uh, will be actually questions at the end of this, and we're looking for that feedback from you now as well. Even though there's not formal action, um, and there's sort of two key rounds of public engagement both now and then a little bit later in the process as we actually take the input that we received through this phase and incorporate it into our design and then release that final, um, uh, the final 15% or preliminary design that we do. So there'll be sort of two pieces, one tonight where we could take your feedback. Then we are gonna be opening um, to the general public just beyond the kind of one-on-one -on -one that we're doing here. And we're doing these one-on-ones with a variety of different like neighborhood groups and uh, advocacy groups, et cetera, just trying to talk directly with them. But then we are coming up here in October, we're gonna be opening um, uh, an, uh, somewhat of an online public engagement where we'll have this presentation with a voiceover associated with it to give people that background. And then we are going to have a poll with a variety of different questions, some of them open ended so that people can kind of throw out there whatever they're thinking. Um, so there'll be opportunity there as well. And then Gene, I might kind of ask you if there would be additional sort of formal um, request for action from this particular group, if that's planned. Yeah, Chris, thank you for that question. Um, I was just I was just um, asking that very question in a chat um, to Valerie, because I actually um, and and I would defer to Natalie, but I don't believe through this process, given that it's a CDOT led project, that we would be asking for a formal action from TAB. But Natalie, if that's not the case, please let me know. That is, that is the case, Jean. And yeah, Jean, we, my, my understanding as well. Oh, yes, sorry, I'm not sure who was just talking. Was that you, Tila? 
Of course. Okay. Um, we the so the East Arapaho Transportation Plan, you know, went through TAB and Council for approval. Um, and and with that kind of guiding this work, that's kind of the level at which we had kind of TAB and Council's approval, and now we're we're moving on implementation, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. A good question, good clarification. Um, so I'll keep moving through. And now we had talked about our, our first option that I showed you. And then this is, uh, that was first west of 55th Street. And this is east of 55th Street. And I will say, again, we're showing you this for full transparency. Um, but the, the, the really are not any significant differences with this. The only difference that you're seeing is the difference in the, the travel lanes. In this case, once we get east of 55th, the number of travel lanes actually do change. We have sort of three in one direction and two in the other in the eastbound direction. And really we're repurposing two of those uh, existing travel lanes still for the bad. So that just narrows that um, east uh, eastbound direction to one uh, general purpose travel lane. But the remainder of these elements as to how the um, uh, areas behind the curb are put together are pretty much exactly the same. And our key focus here as always is on safety. But uh, again, we just wanna make sure that we're being uh, true to exactly what the configuration is along the corridor. So Chris, yeah. sorry, yeah. Sheila again, no, uh, this is basically what it feels to me like the configuration is currently east of 60. Third or so. Is that is that fair to say? Like it's like the configuration of the sixty third is now moving west to about fifty fifth. I think that's fair, yes, um, because you do have some of the bus lanes that exist as you get closer to 63rd, and you've got the wider area, and the lanes do um, are configured slightly differently. So that, in in essence, what we're doing is is implementing that BRT or bad or transit lane all the way through um, to 28th. Uh, so, but that that configuration, at least in portions of the corridor, does actually exist today. But it is true that 55th is kind of a dividing line, and when you get east of that, it does change in terms of the number of lanes and the amount of space that we have to work with. Basically, does that help? Yeah. Well, no. But my question is, isn't this kind of what it looks like right now, east of 63rd? Oh, correct. Yeah, where the where we pick up the bus lanes. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. And so now, I, I think the east of 55th. And so, ideally, eventually, we will dial this road configuration back close to the 30th and 28th. Or you no. got it. That's correct. Yeah, I think that that's fair. Now, what you don't have sort of at 63rd at this point is sort of exactly this configuration behind the curb with the raised protected bike lane, et cetera. Sure, You've got sure. the on street I'm facilities I'm and such. Yeah. On the motor vehicle lane. Correct. So let's move into option number two. Um, and, and what we're doing is looking at these different options to see the on the ground conditions and what the spaces that we have available to us and what the right configuration might be. So this is actually a variation on what we were just looking at. I would say all of the roadway and the transit elements basically remain the same. The only difference that you see here is sort of that back of curb piece again. And what we're doing is actually reorganizing it in a, in a slightly different way. Instead of having that raised protected bike lane directly adjacent to the transit lane, uh, we actually have the, uh, the amenity zone or the landscaped area there. And then we have the protected bike facility as well as the um, multi-use path or, or bikeable sidewalk uh, adjacent to one another. And what that provides us with, there would be or could be some level of differentiation between those so that it's quite clear, this is for biking, this is for um, multi-use path use with some kind of physical uh, demarcation, whether that's through paint or, or other kinds of materials, but that's something that would be determined as the design actually goes on. And we'll, we'll kind of ask you a question about that a little bit later on your preferences. But again, one of the benefits that this provides us, I would say, is that from that maintenance perspective, if you can imagine with these areas of the bike and the multi-use path together, for, as far as clearing snow and ice, we're able to do that um, jointly through those uh, two facilities being next to one another. And then also this landscape area between the roadway and the uh, bike and ped facilities 
actually gives us some location where we could store snow um, when we have snow events, whether it's coming from the road or from clearing snow off the bike and ped facilities. So those, that's really the, the key difference, but it does, because it actually, the way that this is organized, it is a little bit more narrow. So it gives us a little bit more space to play with when we're in areas where you know, we have, you know, along this corridor, we have um, tight spots where there are historic resources that we're going to need to figure out how to avoid. We have certain environmental resources that we're going to need to try and minimize those impacts on or, or parkland um, that we'll be working with. So this allows us a little bit more space. I think there are a couple hands raised maybe. Um, I wanna. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, thanks, Chris. Trini? Yeah, I have a quick question, Chris. And, and, and well, thank you for bringing this to our community because this is like the dream. Um, and I just have a question. So in option two, where the landscaping is going to be, is that going to be raced as well? Or is it going to be at the level of the cars, which may be like a silly question, but it just implies more protection, I think, for the people on the other side of the tree. <laughs> Certainly. Yeah. And, and and no silly questions. I mean, I understand. I mean, we live and breathe this stuff and mm -hmm. we think we put it forward in a way that people can understand, but it's helpful to have that feedback. Um, but yes, it's raised up at curb level, just like your sidewalk is today or your, you know, your landscape area that, that abuts the, um, the roadway. So it, it's similar to, to that situation. So all of this, at least, again, hopefully you're seeing my cursor here, the landscape, the bike and the pedestrian facilities would all be at the same level. And that is then there'd be a curb here that would go down into the gutter area that receives the drainage. And then the roadway itself is slightly lower than everything else. And like how many, I know that here, um, because of our weather, it's challenging to upkeep. Um, I mean, are you thinking of just putting trees up there? I mean, I, I, I know these are just details that you'll think of later, but that to me, this is protection for cyclists and people that are on the side. So again, I mean, if you just have like a little curve and like someone's distracted and they can just jump the curve and, you know, suddenly they're in the bike lane. Whereas the other choice was protected, you know, see, so if maybe if we could add something to that um, curve in order to make sure that cars stay where they're supposed to be. Well, this is the bus, right? I mean, okay. Yeah, sorry. it is the bus lane. So it's yeah, not necessarily, it's, it, it, there's a lot <laughs> yeah. of buses that are going to be out there, but it's not continuous traffic as you might have in some of the other lanes, nonetheless. And you have trained drivers that are, that are, driving those buses as well i mean yeah, that's yeah, no, part I, of the benefit I, yeah i slipped i'm sorry yeah that that gives me more comfort knowing that those are buses um yeah all right i mean <laughs> i will say and it'll probably come up in the discussion where we have the the raised protected bike lane that's uh, here and this is i'm going back to the the option number one where this bike facility is a little bit closer to the bus lane or the transit lanes that are there um it's it, what we're looking at are, are, you know, potentially kind of different types of cyclists, because cyclists, frankly, could be on the multi-use path as well. And they may be people making short trips within the corridor. And the folks that are in the actual bike facility or the raised protected bike lane may be people commuting or going through and trying to go faster, frankly. So there are some considerations around that type of user as to the different kind of configuration, which is why, you know, just having sort of visible separation might be a positive thing if we do have them next to one another adjacent. So I, I don't want to digress too much here. I'd rather get to your, your additional comments and questions. Thank um, you. Was there, was there, an, uh, Becky, let me ask if there was another. Yeah, question. Tila, do you have another question? I see your hand there, or is that from before? I think, Tila? I think that was from before. Okay. Yeah, we're all set. You can go ahead, Chris. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Let me keep rolling here because we do have one option that I want to clarify with you. And there are, I mean, I think you can recognize that we have some tight spots that we're going to have to deal with out here. And one of the key things, as I mentioned in the very beginning, is that our, you know, one of our key tenants is to make sure that we are incorporating all of the mobility elements that were identified within 
the uh, East Arapaho plan and all of the past planning. So making sure we get that transit lane, making sure we get the bike and the ped component. Um, However, we have some real significant constraints, again, whether it's because of a, a historic site or parkland, et cetera, that we have to try and minimize impacts on or, or mitigate all impacts on, frankly. So we are looking at this option number three that we could use at strategic locations where we have these really tight um, uh, elements. And what this really does, I mean, at this is just an example of how it might be applied in a strategic location. So this is the rest of the grayed out um, cross section or typical cross section that we have here uh, is, is similar to the others that we've shown you. But then the box just shows that we could implement all of these mobility elements, but really what you're doing is removing that um, landscape or, or um, uh, amenity zone that we had in the previous ones to try and minimize it as much as possible. And we do have to do that potentially in some areas. And we are still working on figuring out exactly where we would need to do that and what that layout would look like. Um, uh, but again, we are, we're hoping to, to focus these in, in the areas where, where we truly need them and then still provide the, the full cross-section in others. Looks like there's a hand raised there, Becky. Uh, Tila? Question. Yeah, I, I did raise it on purpose this time. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking a whole lot about this kind of stuff recently. And to me, it is shocking that we do not consider whether we restrict transit lanes, uh, motor vehicle lanes, but when something has to give, we have to decide whether the protected bike lane or the multi-use path or the sidewalk has to go. And, you know, I'm sorry, Chris, that I'm, I'm gonna like oh. begin this conversation with you on this particular subject, but why is it that the most vulnerable road users have to potentially give up their own space so that there is throughput for giant vehicles traveling large distances because they cannot be inconvenienced for a quarter of a mile? Yeah, well, I, I understand the comment and, you know, it's a comment that I make as well. So I, I understand where you're coming from. And one of the things that we're trying to do is balance that as well. And so we are looking at um, the uh, amount of people that the, the transit lane could um, actually move through the corridor. And we're looking at making sure that we can accommodate for all of the other uses in the corridor, like I was saying, with the uh, protected bike lane, as well as the multi-use path. So we're trying to balance all of those things out as best we possibly can. Um, but it is, it does come down to uh, really, you know, trying to make it all work and make it all fit, given the amount of congestion that we do have in the corridor as well, from a traffic perspective, we are trying to balance all of those things, um, I would say. Uh, and well, it's looking to me like things like the amenity zone and the um, the buffer in the middle of the road, the median, those are given as constants. And I think that the fact that I'm looking right now at you know, a dotted orange area around our most vulnerable road users on the eastbound section of traffic is telling me we're not actually considering them as equal um, participants of the roadway. Um, well, I understand the comment. There are some technical challenges. I mean, again, if we were to uh, try and utilize that space in the center, for example, from a design perspective, what we want to do is make sure that we're being consistent across all of this as well and not sort of shifting too much and, and changing that. So there are some some other technical details that you know really uh, allow us to make sure that that these elements within the roadway are as consistent as they possibly can be from a safety perspective too. But I guess I, I mean I'm not trying to go sort of point for point with you because I, I don't disagree with your comment, and it is really one of the things that we are constantly you know struggling with and trying to work with to make sure that we can balance it out. But uh, it's 
yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with your comment. Yeah, no doubt. I'm not, I'm not really trying to go point for point, but yeah. honestly, you know, the amenity zone with the, with the plants in the middle strikes me as less critical yeah. than preserving the consistency of a raised protected bike lane and or a multi-use path. I think it's a point well taken and it's one that we can take back and, and really consider as a project team and try and see, you know, what the opportunities really are there. Because, you know, we show you this cross section, but it's not as um, black and white as this either. Absolutely. We, yeah, we have to look at those exact locations as to where we might need to use this and try and minimize it as well. No, no question. But when I when I hear things and I see visuals like this, where there is a dotted orange line around, this is optional. Um <laughs> And the median amenity zone with the plants is not optional. And I'm, I'm a, honestly, I'm a serious plant person. <laughs> I want it all. I want yes and. But if I had to choose, I would give up the plant zone and the median island to preserve throughput and consistency for that protected bike lane, protected multi-use path, protected vulnerable user facility. So if there's if if that if that's a way to summarize the input from me in a new event, that's how I would summarize it. Great. And can I jump in there? Um, and that kind of echoes my sentiment as well. And I guess what we're trying to convey is that if there's ever a choice to eliminate anything, we should never be considering <laughs> vulnerable road user um, safety. Um, so whatever it is that has to be kind of adjusted, at least for you know, places where we are going to find more vulnerable road users because you have the bus right there, for example. But anyway, so I just wanted to echo my support and for Tila. That's helpful. Thank you. So we are going to get to some. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Were we were we a comment period? I, I, I've got some actual that. questions, Ryan. I mean, I it, and oh. if you want to hold for a sec, and and sure. we can get to those, and and we'll we'll come back as as much as we need to 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 talk about this. I'm not going to cut anything off here, um, but I do have just a couple closeout things just so that we get through the full presentation. Um, just thinking about, we mentioned, I think Tila's original comment about just kind of how the stakeholder engagement, or at least how you all would be engaged, uh, thinking about, and I mentioned before that. Coming up in October, we are going to have this online um, uh, presentation with a voiceover and then a, a, a virtual questionnaire. And what we'd like to ask of, of you all as well is to, to get your help as we put together our collateral materials and promotional materials for this to send that to all of you as well so that you can you know utilize it yourself but also send it out to the people that you're connected with and the constituents that you all represent so we'd like to use you to help promote that and get as much feedback as we possibly can as we go forward um just thinking overall about schedule here i mean we're working on uh, working through this um, into uh, a little bit into next year, but I, we really need to get this feedback here in October to understand and get the pulse of what stakeholders are thinking and how that might influence some of the work that we're doing. But it could push us a little bit further into 2024, I think, as we um, start to refine this schedule. We are, in addition to just doing the um, options uh, information that I've given you here, the optioneering, um, we are going to be doing then the actual design work, at least laying it out in a plan view at about the 15%. The so plan view is if you're looking at it as a map from above. And then finally, um, we have been doing some environmental scan on the corridor as well to try and prepare ourselves for the next phase. And the goal here really is going to be how do we set ourselves up as best possible for future funding? Because our goal is to, to help implement this and, and get it really moving forward each time we move from one plan to the next, we're trying to, to advance it just that little bit more so that we can get full funding and ultimately realize this. So I think that was the final um, slide that we have. And then we do have some formal questions and these are gonna be part of that uh, online questionnaire that I was mentioning that we'll release in October as well. But we thought we'd go through these with you also. And you know, as we think about, um, and uh, Becky, I might want to go back to you as to how, you know, you're, I, I want to be respectful of your process here. How do you want us to go through these one by one? How would you like us to facilitate them? 
Um, and that's a good question. It's my first time chairing the meeting, so Understood. I, <laughs> I don't have a strong <laughs> feeling. Um, uh, I mean, I'm I happy think... to keep doing it if, if you're, I just, again, didn't want to overstep. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think if it's more helpful to go one by one for you for feedback, we can, we can certainly do that or just, or if it's more helpful just to have each person speak to any of these things that they have a comment on, we can yeah. do it that way too. Becky, I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Tila here. Um, I think we could probably do a straw poll on number one and then go through, uh, you know, two and three people raising their hands if they have something. I think Ryan is correct. We should probably do questions first, like clarifying questions versus sort of, um, you know, feedback and responses. But I think in terms of if, if we just wanted to do, does anyone have questions, clarifying questions, not clear on stuff? Let's do that first. Then I would suggest number one alone, straw poll. And then two and three would be kind of where we have more substantive discussion. And honestly, four, we're likely going to have exposed all of those ideas in the uh, consideration of two and three. That's my suggestion, Madam <laughs> Chair. Um, yeah, I think that's great, Tila. Uh, yeah, happy to move ahead with that if that works for Chris. Yeah, I'm good with that. And let's go to general questions and clarifying things first. Great. Thank you. Um, see, does anybody have uh, general clarifying questions for Chris? Yeah, Ryan. Chris, I have two. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to make sure I've, I've got the the option, the way the options work right. My understanding is you you've got two different options, or sorry, three different options, and those options represent different like archetypes that will work along the corridor. We're not choosing one option. To, this is, we're not getting, you're not eventually going to get to a single option for the whole, the whole quarter. This is about like, you're going to use all three of these and you want feedback on are these the three like sort of tools. Is that right? Or exactly. It's um, you're, you're right. These are all kind of variations on sort of the, the ideal um, uh, vision that was created in the East Arapaho plan. And now again, we're trying to make them fit and work. And there are some variations on that. And there are different contexts that we might use these in. Okay. Um, for example, where, you know, you have like large mature trees along the corridor, for example, we might use some of these to try and avoid taking those trees out, of course, et cetera. So, yeah. Okay. Got it. I just wanted to make sure you weren't asking to choose one over the other. You're asking. Do, Not necessarily, but, okay. but it is, you know, if there are options to, if we have the choice to use one over another in a particular location, it would be helpful to understand okay. where there are preferences. Great, thank you. And then my second question, um, Chris Hagelin inspired me earlier on talking about city code, proposing code code changes. And I'm just wondering, um, like, are there, uh, you know, Teela was discussing the the uh, ideal of not um, encroaching on the physical safety of our people outside of vehicles. Are there any cases in which city code that you, you can obviously name is is standing in the way of, of better technical solutions that would be you know fuller and more accessible? I, it might be too hard. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, so maybe this wasn't studied. But I'm just sort of curious if there's any anything obvious that's standing out where we're like the the elephant in the room here is like, well, there's a city code matter that makes this more technically challenging. Well, we've been working. I'm going to throw this to the city to to really speak about that. And and Gene, you might want to call on either yourself or others. But I mean, we have been developing as part of our design um, design standards, and what that requires is that we go through the city standards, the state standards, you know, national best practice, all of these things to try and understand how would we or should we design this, and to make sure that we're being consistent with all the rules and regs that are out there. So that is part of our job to figure that out. I, I will say off the top of my head, I honestly don't know um, whether um, at this moment in time, there's anything that would need to change in order to make some of these things happen. And Gene, can I throw it to you? I don't know if there's other thoughts that the city would have on that. Yeah, actually, Garrett's going to respond to that question. Thanks. Okay. Good evening, Garrett Slater, Capital Projects Manager for the Transportation and Mobility Department. And uh, to answer that question, Ryan, the city code generally uh, speaks to um, 
uh, requirements and laws at a higher level and uh, doesn't get into the particulars of design standards and the document in the city that pertains to that type of uh, regulatory content would be the design and construction standards, which we've uh, presented to you with various updates over the years. Um, and so um, that would be the, the city reference that we would turn to for a question uh, uh, on how to approach the uh, design here of CO7 in our Arapahoe. But uh, as Chris has also noted, because this is a CDOT facility, we also have to give consideration to the set of standards that the state has, uh, and their standard is called the MNS standards. And so um, that's also uh, something that has to be considered as this uh, design continues to evolve. Got it. Thanks very much, Gary and Chris. That's all I have for questions. Ryan, um, Tila, do you have a, another question? I just see your hand. I wasn't sure if that was from before or not. Uh, I'm not hearing you, Tila, but if you do have a question, feel free to. I'm having a hard time with the oh, okay. technology tonight. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, no, that was from before. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Thanks. Um. Uh, I have one question about uh, um, intersections. Is that part of this? Is that a later phase of this process or um, yeah, what? Um, yeah. Yeah, what I'm happy to. About that now? No, intersections are definitely part of this. Now, there are some specific intersections along the, the corridor that the city can probably speak to that, you know, are going to be handled slightly differently. But the majority of intersections along the corridor are part of uh, our effort of design. And what we're looking at are, you know, how particularly how the bike and the ped components uh, intersect at both uh, intersections, so signalized intersections or unsignalized intersections, as well as um, private access points also. So just entrances into, you know, uh, businesses, et cetera. And we are looking for the bike and pedestrian piece of those protected intersections that were envisioned in uh, the East Arapahoe transportation plan. And you'll see that as right now, what we're showing all of you are these typical cross sections. So we kind of start here on, you know, are these cross sections generally acceptable? Do they generally work? What are the tweaks we need to make to them? And then once we have some buy off on that, we then move to that actual layout design in a plan view, like a map, basically. And we start to lay out all of that, all of those intersections, all of those crossings, etc, to make sure that they are safe, and they are visible, so that uh, cyclists can see cars coming through and, and people driving can see the cyclists coming through, et cetera. So we have to think about all of those details, but the intersections are included in here, um, other than some of the other major intersections that could be funded and designed separately from ours. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions for Chris? Okay. For real, I did raise my hand on purpose this time. <laughs> Go ahead, Tila. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am curious what um, interaction you have had with the developers uh, of, I think it was formerly called Watershed, Water something, um, but for developers who are working on transit-oriented development along Arapahoe Avenue now and in the next 10 years. Um, what kind of coordination is there? What kind of support is there for such development? What kind of restrictions are there that we should be aware of and thinking about um, in terms of how the city is regulating this kind of stuff? Certainly. And I'll make a few comments. And then uh, again, uh, Gene, I'll put you on the deck also, because I'm you probably will need to follow up from the city's perspective on this, because again, I don't want to speak for the city here. But um as far as coordination, and I think it's called Weather Vane now. I can't remember the name of the development, but I, I think it's that Weather That sounds Vane. familiar. Yeah, yeah, I think that might be it. Um, so we have uh, connected with them directly, and they've gone through a pretty extensive, because they're actually in the process, they're designing and they're they're getting approvals, and, and I, I, I believe maybe they have approvals at this point, um, but they're a little bit unique because they're in the middle of all of this. They're not coming later on down the road once our work is complete, but 
as it stands today, they've been going through a process of getting their approvals. So we are kind of responding to the things that have already been in, approved for them, which includes um, bike and pedestrian facilities and was taking into account many of these things. So their, their design may not look exactly like the cross sections that I'm showing you, but we have been laying in what's been approved for their site as sort of the condition that might happen in front of that particular development. Um, in the future, once our design is complete, um, then that actually continues to give the city more um, uh, ability to work with future developers that come in to make sure that whatever design they are doing on the frontage of their new development meets the design that we expect and that we've laid out. So then they'll start to respond to us once we're done. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Thank you very much. Sure. And then, Jean, I don't know if there's more you want to say about how that typically works. Yeah, no, Chris, I think you answered that really well. And, you know, just specifically, Tila and, and all of the TAB members, you know, this is such an important step in the process for us because, you know, one of the things that we, the city, needs to have in place to require things like these specific infrastructure um, pieces or even just reservation of right of way or easements is a right of way plan, which we will have from this 15% design. We will know how much right of way we need and really have um, sort of the plan of the profiles so that when developers come in, and, and as we, we all know, this area is changing quickly, we're able to um, make those um, exact, well, not exactions, but we're able to negotiate um, that space or those infrastructure elements from them. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. So do we want to move to our questions here now? Um, yeah, I think it's good timing. So on the, sorry, I got to find space on my computer. I'm working off my little laptop here and I have no space to see anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> So for the very first one, you know, considering the existing conditions, I mean, you know that we have some constraints along the corridor. I, you know, do you generally agree with the three typical design cross sections that we've put forward? And, and maybe that is one that, you know, folks can just kind of speak to or, or straw poll, however you want to do it. It's kind of up to you. For two and three, I do have some graphics that we can flip to to help you understand those a little better, too. So. Great. Uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and start with one. Um do a straw poll. Um, if anybody has any additional comments, though, I want to give you that oppor opportunity to speak. Does anyone have any additional comments for, for number one? Or or we can go ahead and just do a straw poll now. OK. Um, I think my only comment yeah. um, would be, you know, I've had some deep soul searching lately about what our kind of default um, road design is. And so this is no worse than any of them. <laughs> and I think giving a thumbs up to this entire plan is not going to make my future or our future work any more difficult. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give this a thumbs up. Uh, thanks, Tila. Um, I'm also, uh, uh, gen in, in general agreement with the direction of the study and the cross sections offered here. Um, Ryan and Trini? Me too. I would agree with your, both of your eloquence. Great. Thanks. Um, Chris, should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So in terms of the design options that we showed you of option one and two, I, I'm, I'm, we are curious if you have any particular thoughts on, you know, which might best achieve the safety and comfort goals. And really the, the big difference, and, and we can flip back and forth to these if we need to, is that location of the, um, uh, the landscape amenity zone in essence. Um, is either separating and having the multi-use path um, separated from the uh, race protected bike lane and the race protected bike lane adjacent to the, the uh, transit lane. So uh, to maybe help with that a little bit, this is just sort of comparing the, those elements behind the curb kind of side by side as I was talking about. So 
the difference here is this raised protected bike lane. All of this space, as we were talking about before, is raised up uh, above the curb, you know, uh, at the curb, basically. So all of this is higher than the transit lane. Uh, however, this bike facility is closer to the transit lane, um, as opposed to here where you do have that separation space associated with a landscape uh, amenity zone. But the trade off to that is that you have, you know, bikes uh, adjacent to the multi use path, which allows bikes as well, but probably at a little bit slower pace, we would expect because it's probably a different kind of user. So I guess I, we're curious, do you think either of these present something that might feel either more comfortable or safe, in your opinion, at least? Um, thank you so much for that question and for pulling that out. I, in particular, am in favor of consolidating the vulnerable road users. So I would like option two. Um, because uh, to me, the the bigger dangers, I mean, there are conflicts at the intersections and that's not what we're showing. We're showing kind of a mid-block cross section. But uh, in general, what I have observed, and this, this looks kind of like the Broadway multi-use path here, um, is concentrating the vulnerable road users, lets them negotiate their shared space at a lower speed and uh, sort of a lower level of potential catastrophe. So that's kind of where I would leave that. That's helpful. Can I chime in? I, I favor option one because of multiple reasons. One has to do with the fact that everything's raced. So I think that that if for whatever reason a car happens to veer into the transit lane and then eventually onto the path, I think there's there's a, a physical barrier, right? And I do believe that with you know faster traffic of cyclists like um, you were referring to and e-bikes, I think that it's very smart to separate you know, pedestrians and cyclists. I think the dream is to have each, so each of us has a way to get there safely. Um, and also, I don't know how much of this, um, the actual greenery that would be dividing, you know, on option two, I don't know how much of that we could actually upkeep. I know it's challenging because of the weather, like I said earlier, Um I know it presents a challenge for snow removal, but at the same time, I and mean, we do have an amazing system here. I I see that during you know high snow season, most of the paths are are beautifully plowed. So that's my two cents. I appreciate that, but I, I do want to just make sure I clarify one thing to make sure I understand, if you don't mind. Yeah. Because um and I. I your point is one that we're we've talked about a lot in terms of the speed and e-bikes and things like that so that makes good sense to me um however when we think about a buffer between these it seems at least in our opinion as we've been talking about it as a project team that option two and having that actual you know eight foot of space that physically separates between the the lane of travel or the transit lane here and these facilities is really acting as that buffer where this, uh, I, I guess, I, with then these cyclists are then closer to the actual um, lane of travel. And that, but that would be your preference. Is that fair? Just because they're kind of a different kind of user. Is that kind of the logic there? Yes and no, because I feel that option one would actually have a buffer, like a physical, not just a the curb but because that's what i understood right i mean that would be a protected bike lane or am i just hallucinating that uh, no 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 yeah I, I think I, I might not have explained it completely clearly so my apologies but um so uh, the raised protected bike lane like the difference that we're talking about when we say a raised protected bike lane is actually the, probably the level of both option one and option two are basically the oh. same um, but the when we say raised protected bike lane, it's the difference between like an on-street painted bike lane 
um, mm -hmm. or one that's actually part of the asphalt that's out, you know, part of the asphalt that's out here in the lane, of, near the lane of travel versus one that's actually at the same level as a sidewalk. So that's really the difference between a raised protected bike lane and, and just a standard bike lane that's painted in. Does that make sense? Yeah, so then I'm with Tila. Um, then I would move the cyclist as far as possible from any car interaction. And I know we have the transit lane there, but I'm just thinking of worst case scenario. And yeah, I think it's less likely for pedestrians and cyclists to have, you know, any sort of fatal interaction than. Right. Thank you, Chris, for. Thank you for clarifying that. that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, we, we live and breathe it and think everybody understands this stuff. So good questions. Yeah. Ryan, did you have um, yeah. thoughts on this? I was thinking it through. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I was just sort of imagining that like in the scenario where the, the, the relative car speed is lower and the bike speed is higher because there's not, there, there's not a lot of, um, you know, breaks in the road intersections then it is, you know, there's an advantage to keeping the bikes away from pedestrians. Um, so I was kind of following Trini, but I, I think, I think I'm, I'm happy with option two. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with option two. Yeah. And I kind of similar, I, I don't think I started with strong feelings. Um, they both are very appealing <laughs> changes to the roadway, but, um, uh, you know, agree with the comments that Tila and Trini made um, about some of the benefits of, of option two. And also, I think, as mentioned, some of the, the right of the reduced need for right of way in, in some places, that additional benefit as well. Yeah, it helps so us. So glad to hear it. So it sounds like tab um, feedback is unanimous. That is helpful. So let's move on to number three, and I think it'll build on what we were just talking about, actually, but um, which configuration where we're talking about the adjacent bike and pedestrian facilities, should it be, you know, physic, um, uh, marked or demark uh, have a demarcation in some way or not? And I'm using these images, and they're not perfect, so forgive me, um, but uh, the it gives you a sense of uh, this is a raised on the, the left hand side here. This is a raised uh, protected bike lane um, and then uh, with an adjacent sidewalk. And you just get the point that, you know, there's a space that's clearly identified for bikes and there's a space adjacent to it that's clearly identified for multi use path, sidewalk, et cetera. Or would your preference be to allow people to, you know, basically police themselves and, and be safe and understand, you know, that that both bikes and pedestrians share this space? and not have that kind of demarcation. So I think it's worth a little bit of discussion here too. I think that, you know, thinking long-term, um, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen as far as e-bikes and how fast we're gonna be moving. And and we do want to encourage people to commute. And so I, I am for, I don't like how that is divided. I feel that that's kind of, not very aesthetically pleasing, but I do believe that if there was some delineation of where cyclists were meant to go and separate um, pedestrians, I think that would be the ideal situation. I appreciate that. And the look of this, yeah, please don't assume that this is exactly how we would necessarily do it. It is something that would need to follow the the city standards and would be determined at the time of, you know, kind of final design and, and field construction. So, uh, but a, a, we were hoping to at least get the point across with the image. Well, thank you. Tila? Thank you. So again, I'm a little frustrated that it's like either or here. <laughs> which which leftover afterthought space shall commuting cyclists occupy? Um, because I can see the value of the mixed space picture for lesser um less 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 brave less experienced younger cyclists and i think we should honestly be building spaces for them and then the quote defined space is also not uh, um, attractive to someone like me like i am 
I am more confident in traffic like this. And I'm actually sitting right now across the table from my um, Brazilian um, exchange student. And it was quite clear three weeks ago, he was not experienced in cycling. And he's made dramatic increases. And I'm cool with it. My husband's not. Like, we're we're honestly, we're on different sides of the same. Like, he is safe to ride to school fence. Um, and so I'm frustrated that we have to say, like, which leftover version of the streetscape shall we dedicate to the vulnerable road users? So I love that you've transitioned back to option one and option two, because I think both of those... Um, and in particular, option two are catering to the less skilled, less used to negotiating um, high speed commercial traffic. Like, we need to be building a more resilient and more forgiving transportation network. And it is not those two pictures that you showed me. I think we have a good response for you here because in 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 Boulder, really, you're gonna you're gonna build me a new road network? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, uh, we're, well, we're working on it. I mean, you know, uh -uh. to some extent, it, it's Carry incremental. On. I'll give you, but nonetheless, <laughs> um, in this image, so what we were yep. trying to show you were, uh, was option two, and you know, how would you set up op <laughs> option two? Would all of this just be gray, and everyone could sort of uh, be in free you know, for all? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, or do you do you physically separate it up? Now, this gray part that's over here, even though mm -hmm. it's not physically marked as a bike space, it is a multi-use path or a bikeable mm -hmm. sidewalk in Boulder. Mm -hmm. The both mm -hmm. of those spaces actually allow for bikes to use them. And it, it, you were kind of spot on. I mean, the gray area is likely for those people either doing short trips within the corridor or maybe those less confident cyclists that would right. want to go slower. Or the ones with wobbly little kids. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. then the others that are commuters or more confident or whatever would be in that outer faster lane, et cetera. Mm. So it's exactly the scenario that we're well, let's talk about that though. I am, I am a, a commuter and more confident rider. And in many places I will choose to use the multi-use path. Uh, in other places where the multi-use path is uh, more occupied by the less capable, the younger, the wobblier, I will go over in the road. And I have every right to do so under the law. But as the saying goes, the law forbids the rich and poor from sleeping under bridges, right? I am relegated to a dangerous, uncomfortable, inequitable section of the road, even though I have every legal right to be there. I think the dream, Tila, is to have that be protected. And so if we had that alternative be completely safe, I am with you. Like if that, that should be our right, but unfortunately it's going to take time to get there. And in the meantime, if we're going to build something, we should be thinking long-term. And yeah. I, am, I mean, a hundred percent. I think that there are people that have different abilities that all have to share the same space. And that's kind of my hesitation. I mean, because there should be a protected bike lane, you know, for those who are commuting, but until that yeah. happens, we have to kind of make space for them. And, um, and maybe this is their space, you know, I mean, it's kind of a, a very tricky place to be. I love it, Trini. And, you know, we, I think we're saying the same thing, like option yeah. two is preferred, but then we hear Chris saying, you know, it's, it's preferred and we'll do it where we can. But when a push comes to shove, when it gets difficult, that bike lane and that vulnerable user space is going to disappear because as a matter of policy, we have decided the throughput for the motor vehicles, it reigns supreme. Well, that has to change because our goal is zero. And if we yeah. don't prioritize, Chris, then we won't get there. Appreciate the Any feedback. Any response, Chris, Well, Natalie, anybody? <laughs> 
I would say that we'll keep moving forward with, you know, pushing on this particular subject and also taking into account the, the feedback that we receive here and see how we can address, you know, the concerns that are here. Uh, you know, we are working within a constrained environment. Um, and, but at the same time, I mean, it, it, we came to you today and to, to try and hear what you had to say and, and we'll give some additional thought to it and see what we can work through. Um, I, I do think it's an incremental process of change here too. So that's, I, I, I wish I could, you know, commit to, to making, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the bigger, uh, more substantive kind of um, uh, changes to the network as a whole that, that you're bringing up. But I mean, that really is, is your role as, as TAB is to help push those things as well. So I, I, I appreciate the thoughts and, and we'll keep uh, no, thinking and, about and how so to incorporate it. Yeah. I just want to add, and the fact that we're having this conversation alone is huge. I think that that just demonstrates everybody's kind of eagerness to, to reach the same goal. And I, I understand that you guys have barriers, but Certainly. with our help, perhaps we can help, you know, get through those barriers easier. Like you said, I mean, that is what we're here for. Great. Ryan? Uh, Ryan? Thanks. I, I had a little bit of a different take on the feedback. Um, I agree with everything Tila said, um, but I, I guess I, when, when Chris is asking the question, I was thinking of the question was sort of like imagining the difference between like on Boulder Creek path where I think it's about around 13th, where east of 13th, it's a mixed space and uh, west, like approaching the library, it becomes the defined space where it's clear that there's a there's a bike path and a pedestrian path. To me, that was I thought was more the question is being asked, like this, assuming a, a given amount of of um of width. So, Chris, is that like? It, well, it it was really kind of a preference of you know would we would you want them to be separated throughout or physically denoted throughout versus to be combined throughout? You mean between um, the pedestrian and the bike and the bike? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So so looking at that option two, it's like how would would you actually physically denote the different spaces, or would you just have them be one large space and allow right. individuals to make the choice, you know, as to how they act in that area? Then it sounds like the example I'm I'm giving I think is the example. I, although maybe on on Boulder Creek when it gets west, of it's about 13th. Maybe it gets wider, so it's not it's not a perfect example. But to me, it seems like the, like a, a, a factor here is if there's if there's just a lot more traffic, if it's a lot more um, there's just like a lot more going on with with both um, bikes and uh, pedestrians, then the defined space tends to make more sense. If if it's less, you know, if, if it's less. Um, uh i guess if there's less pedestrian or if it's maybe more either more bike or more pedestrian i don't know like like foothill parkway or goose creek if it's more mixed i think it works fine so i don't know it seems like the, to me this question of like what's the density or the um throughput happening um because less less throughput less density would suggest a mixed space is better um to me but i, I don't feel strongly either about it but i just thought i'd offer that yeah, it's a fair point. And I mean, one of the things that we understand about this particular corridor is that it is a, a fairly significant commuter corridor for cyclists. So you do have those confident, faster cyclists that are coming through on, on commute necessarily. And I don't know to what extent COVID, et cetera, has sort of changed some of that, but um, just, a, just a thought. I'll uh, follow up on, on Ryan's comments. I, um, yeah, I definitely like the defined space, I think. I, I also thought of Boulder Creek Path and just how chaotic it is. And it's as beautiful as it is, is kind of a frustrating experience for people walking and biking because they're fighting for space because it's so popular. <laughs> so it's a good problem to have. But um, yeah, I just think you separate by speed and bikes go faster. So, um, and really also just for the sake of if, you know, in wanting people to feel comfortable using different modes, I think a lot of people learn not to bike and scooter and, and use a scooter because they don't like as a pedestrian the experience of being mixed in with people biking and on scooters because it feels unsafe to them to be kind of have people starting around them and so i just think anytime we can avoid that scenario you know the best in class thing to do is to separate um and I, you know i love that we have the the ability to do that on this corridor so 
um, I'm really excited to see that as as what's being shown in the in the cross sections here. Great. Why don't we move on to? Oops, sorry. I need to go back to question here. The final one. It's pretty open ended here, and and that was intentional to allow folks to you know kind of make sure that they're getting out their particular thoughts. But for this particular phase of work, you know, we are at this fifteen percent design. Um, you know, so we're not in final design, we're not in construction yet. So just keeping in mind where we're at, um, you know, are there other design considerations that, that we should be making or things that you all can think of that we should uh, put in the mix? I think I just want to reiterate what we were speaking about earlier, that if anything has to go, it should never be where pedestrians or more vulnerable road users are going to be. We should have the space to feel safe and to get from point A to point B always safely. So we have this amazing opportunity right now to create this new way of moving around. So let's just, uh, my my personal <laughs> ask is that you guys keep that in mind always. And unfortunately, yes, if plans have to go, they have to go. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's one thing. And um. And I guess if if there's a there's a, a possibility then to have protected bike lanes, and so then we we expand that area, right? So then we have a, a way that commuters can move around and you know do it at a speed that they need to go at, and um, and then that have the space for people that don't feel as comfortable and is and still separated from pedestrians because Becky raises a really, really good point. I mean, now with scooters and I, I, I do, when I'm riding, I do feel, and I am, I try to be as kind and as, you know, I, I approach people slowly, but I see that not everybody does that, you know? So, so yeah. But anyway, well, that's my input. Appreciate it. Ryan? My only thought now is on um, other design considerations. So we've looked mostly, at least the pictures mostly, at the mid block. Um, are we are intersections a part of this discussion at this point, or this is really about? Do you want feedback on that too, or are we just uh, as it stands right now? I mean, as the intersections are concerned, it's uh, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that um, we are going to be looking at intersections right now. We're at this sort of cross section level. If we can get general buy off on that, these are the 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 basic cross sections that we want to try and apply of course you know there are going to be variations in the quarter but and then at the intersections we are looking to apply the um protected bicycle intersections that were envisioned within the east arapaho transportation plan and also really thinking about safety and particularly visuals at um crossings where you know you have private access points or or you know non uh uh, signalized intersections, for example, we're going to be thinking, we're thinking about that as okay. well. But that is sort of the next phase that we move into as we go into design, we'll start to take those cross sections and then lay them out in that plan view in the actual design and be able to, to demonstrate exactly how those protected intersections would work. There are, uh, you know, some intersections, some of the major ones that uh, like Foothills, for example, where there's sort of separate projects around those that will um, be separate from the work that we do, but the majority of intersections would uh, be included within our project. Great. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I feel um, I feel happy for now. I just will associate my comments with uh, with Tila. <laughs> She's been very eloquent. Um, and then when it comes to intersections, yeah, that, that'll be that'll be good to talk about. Yeah, just like a lot with that. So um, great. Thank you for your working on. I'll tag along. My my one thought was just also on intersections, and I'll um, just have one comment on that, which is my one fear would be that there would be really long crossing distances without any kind of like I know there's the I the sort of central median in the cross section, but I'd be afraid that that would turn into one or two turning lanes, and suddenly pedestrians are crossing what? seven no lanes of traffic with no you know, no median, no island, nothing that, so I, I hope that can really be avoided as much as possible. Those, those really long crossing distances. Um, so that's my, my hope for the intersections. Okay. That's a good point. 
and some of the things that we're doing, because we are thinking about that as well, you know, with the, uh, by it, remember that throughout the corridor, we are sort of repurposing um, some existing travel lanes into the transit lanes. And I think that helps some because those transit lanes are not going to have consistent traffic throughout. Now, those transit lanes can also be utilized for turning traffic into private businesses and things like that. They're not completely separated, but they are primarily for the, the buses. Um, and we are trying to think about the, the, again, the protected intersections, particularly for the bike and the pedestrian connections across. So it's a really good point, And we're going to be uh, looking at that in more detail as we start to actually lay this out, but it's a, it's uh, definitely helpful. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other comments on additional design considerations? Okay. Well, um, thanks, Chris. Uh, this was really Thank informative and it's a really exciting project. So appreciate you coming here and um, sharing it with us and answering all our questions. Thanks for your time. All right. I think we are on to our next um, agenda item now, um, which is uh, matters from staff. Yes. Hi, Becky. We have a few tonight, um, and I think we're going to try to go through them quickly since we're just a little bit behind. Um, and our first one tonight, Garrett's going to provide an update on um, the sidewalk upgrades conversation that we've been having with you all. Hello again. So you might recall from our bicycle tour a few weeks back when we stopped on Cedar and around 15th Street, to uh, take a look at the sidewalk repairs that took place as part of the pavement management program, um, that we had some conversation about the right way to implement sidewalk, and in particular, the curb type adjacent to sidewalk as to whether they should be mountable or vertical curb treatments, with the issue being that uh, some vehicles are inclined to, uh, to not understand the barrier between a mountable curb uh, and thinking that they should put their wheels up on the sidewalk, where a vertical curb prevents that behavior from happening and keeps the vehicles off the sidewalk. So <clears throat> uh, I, I also thought it might be helpful for you to understand that uh, if I didn't emphasize this on the tour, that it would be helpful to understand there are two, me two means by which we repair sidewalks in a major way. One is the sidewalk repair program, and the other is through the pavement management program, where when we find sidewalk adjacent to streets that we're going to be repaving, we uh, go in and upgrade curb ramps to bring them into compliance with ADA standards, and also repair sidewalks to bring them into our own standards with respect to horizontal and vertical joint displacement. So, Having consulted the city staff and the construction crews that we typically contract with, uh, because we don't self perform this work, we don't have the resources or, or the in-house expertise to do this type of work. So we rely uh, exclusively on our external contractor partnerships. And <clears throat> we um, had, had a few meetings with them and also talked amongst ourselves uh, about the desires, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, what we uh, have concluded is that uh, we'd like to move forward with a modification to the sidewalk repair. <clears throat> Why do I get the frog right when it's time to talk? <clears throat> um, uh, that we should um, move forward with an experimental approach to uh, uh, implementing vertical curb treatment as part of the pavement management and the sidewalk repair program when we have a run that's longer than 100 feet. And the issue you might uh, recall from our bike tour is that um, many of the sidewalk repairs are replacing just a single section or uh, or single um, slab or stone, which might vary in length from six feet to eight feet. Uh, sometimes you'll see a, a couple of sections adjacent to one another. And uh, so, what we don't want is to have this continuous back and forth from mountable to vertical and mountable to vertical uh, treatment along a single block. And so we would like to uh, try to have a uniform section for drainage and accessibility purposes to driveways as, as much as possible. 
uh, <clears throat> and also make it uh, um, as easy as possible for our contractors to, to be able to build. And so uh, with an average block length in the city being between 400 feet to 600 feet, uh, we arrived at, uh, uh, for next year's program, we would like to work with a number of 100 feet. When we have uh, a replacement section, section longer than 100 feet, that we will uh, uh, transition to a vertical curb section um, in those areas, uh, even where there are driveways present, then we'll transition back, but uh, work to try to create that better delineation between the, the vehicle parking space and the pedestrian walking space. So that's the, the update on what our next steps are, and um, we'll uh, be eager to see how it plays out on the construction side and see what your feedback is as we uh, work to uh, implement that into the program. Thanks, Garrett. Any questions from Tab before we keep going? I was just going to say thank you for your follow up on that and um, letting us know about the change and looking into that. Um, we'll appreciate it. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. All right. Our next update, um, I think either Jean or Valerie is here to speak to. Um, there's just a request with this one and a brief update. Yeah, and Natalie, I'll go ahead and cover this one. Okay. Hi, Jean. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Um, so I'll keep it brief. Thanks. Um, so just introducing a um, a planning project that is just getting underway and is being sponsored by the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. Um, they are funding a couple of co a pilot corridor planning projects. And um, we, the city of Boulder, Boulder County, Louisville and Lafayette, were selected as a pilot project to develop a corridor plan for the South Boulder Road Corridor connecting all of our communities. Um, and so the purpose of the South Boulder Road Corridor Plan is to develop a vision um, for, for that corridor, a multimodal vision, you know, much in the way that we started with either the East Arapaho Plan or the 119 Corridor. Um, South Boulder Road is one of the Northwest Area uh, Mobility Study Corridors, so it is a NAMS Corridor, and it's actually the last of the NAMS Corridors for us to begin thinking about how to identify improvements to enhance multimodal connectivity between the communities. So this is really the start of developing that vision for the corridor. And Dr. Cog is putting together a steering committee um, and the role of that steering committee will be to recommend ideas, develop partnerships, goals, vet recommendations and act as ambassadors for the project for respective communities and interest groups. And so um, we have put forward a number of organizations that we think would be appropriate for that steering committee, such as members of Community Cycles, Center for People with Disabilities, CU, BVSD. And we also think that um, having a member of TAB on the steering committee would be um, a really great um, addition to the steering committee. And so um, the commitment would be to attend between four and six meetings over the course of the next year, they're hoping to schedule their first meeting in early October, and we're putting that to TAB this evening to ask if um, one of you might be interested in serving on that steering committee. I would love to do that if nobody else wants to. <laughs> you need a, uh, uh, what's it called, a primary and an alternate, Gene, or do you, what are you, what are you asking for? I think, yes, they haven't asked for an alternate, but I think it would be a good idea for us to propose an alternate as well. Thanks. I don't, I don't need to be either. I just wanted to ask. <laughs> oh, come, but Ryan, you spoke up. So <laughs> I think by default, you're now the alternate. <laughs> just wanted to let Becky and Tila know if they had a shot to raise their hand. Otherwise, Al, we can, we can name Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, Trini, I'm, I'm happy for you to to be the representative, and I'm also um, happy to serve as an alternate uh, as needed. Yay. Thank you. That's wonderful. Trini and Becky, thanks very much. We really appreciate that, and we'll be in touch with more information. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Jim. Great. Thank you. Okay, our next item that we had under matters um, 
can also be brief. I just wanted to make sure that you all saw the message um, that I sent. It was probably a couple of weeks ago now, um, just providing an update on the 2024-2029 transportation CIP. Um, and I'll just mention Mark Wolf from our budget office is actually here this evening. She, he hung in with us <laughs> through the meeting. Um, so he's here to help answer any questions um, as well. So I will just kind of provide a quick recap of the information that was shared. And that was just that we made a couple revisions to the CIP um, that came to you, the, the draft that came to you back in July we made a couple of revisions too after, as a city, we completed kind of our budget process. Um, the city manager's office had the, the draft final budget that is moving forward to city council, um, included a couple of revisions. And those were primarily, those were around um, our pavement management program. And we also added an additional project for Violet Avenue Bridge. Um, and, and this was really due to, there was a need for us to look at tra additional transportation funding to meet these needs. Um, originally, we thought that they would kind of be able to live within the Community Cultural Resilience and Safety Fund um, allocation. And just as the city kind of took a look at citywide needs, it was recognized that there was much more need than the fund, the CCRS fund had available. Um, and so we were able to kind of take a more holistic look at what the transportation fund could potentially um, take on from these needs. And that's where the addition of the pavement management program, additional um, funding around just being able to bolster our pavement management program that was added in and then the Violet Avenue Bridge was added in as well. And I'll just note the Violet, Violet Avenue Bridge funding, when you look at the CIP, it's um, you know pretty minimal in the 2024, 2025 timeframe because we're really looking at just some funding around furthering design um, over the next couple of years. There will potentially be a more significant leap need in those out years around Violet Avenue Bridge. Um, assuming we can't find any other funding sources citywide, we will be looking for the transportation fund to help fund that project. Um, and Garrett Slater is also, of course, here this evening. So if there's questions about those projects, he can help answer those questions too. Um, but I think that about sums it up. Um, but feel free to just ask any questions of any of us here tonight. Thank you. Can I ask just a quick clarifying question, Natalie? I, mm -hmm. I, I missed the part you said the transportation fund will be potentially required to cover what exactly? So Violet Avenue Bridge, if you, I should have put a slide because that probably would have been a bit easier, but um, when you look at the CIP, you'll see Violet Avenue Bridge is now in the CIP for the transportation fund. But it's only like a million and a half, I think, off the top of my head, um, in the 24-25 timeframe. So you don't see a huge um, kind of significant investment in those out years in the CIP for Violet App. But assuming we can't find any other funding sources citywide, we will be looking to the transportation fund. I think it's likely that transportation fund is probably going to need to take care of uh, a big piece of that in the out years around construction, um, but we may have some other potential funding partners even within the city um, that could help us out with that. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Anything to add there, Garrett, Mark? I think you covered it. Okay. We mostly just felt like, you know, it was good to kind of provide that update given that what you saw in July was a bit different than what we submitted um, and didn't want you all to just be surprised at what was in council's packet this, this week, later this week. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Becky, I don't know if you were you doing comments or questions on this one or may, may I offer? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, mainly I'm talking to Mark because Mark, 
it's good to have you here. And um, just to reiterate something I'd said previously um, when we looked at last, which was, I mean, I trust the the work of the staff on this. I don't have any questions about the substance of it, um, but I am very interested in the way we package the the story to our to our city council um, in in this in the sense that we have a um, we we have initiatives in transportation that if if we do them right, like according to the best scholarly work and practitioner evidence, we are cost negative. If we can give if we can create a transportation system where we let people escape car dependence and, and they can walk and bike freely and they have transit that comes frequently so that they don't have to you know do the other stuff and we make land use work well to enable all that. We save money. It's 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 a positive it's a positive investment, and um, I don't think that's a very popularly understood thing with with just you know with council with the public. And um, I just think you know we're in a climate crisis. You look at intergovernmental panel on climate change and what they say about cost measures and and transit and and biking is one of the few cost measures of all that's like that's negative if if you do it right not saying it's easy but like it's 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 a question of financing is, is is what we need to be figuring out and so i just um i just get really uneasy when we let these conversations go by about like oh transportation doesn't have enough money and i don't want to suggest that like transportation is more important than other things but i do think that we have work to do to educate our elected body and our and the public about the need to figure out financing strategies for transportation so that we can save money because we're right now locked into a problem that's that's costing us a lot of subsidies that we don't need to pay for. So not an easy thing to just like take take forward, but I just would love to see when we go to council with this, like, oh, we don't have enough money for transportation that we're really, we're really talking about this. And if you need a guest speaker, I'm sure somebody from town will volunteer <laughs> to come talk about it. Um, so in any case, th thanks for your work. And I know this isn't this isn't easy stuff. Um, so appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for that, Ryan. And good to be with everybody tonight. Um, I, I would just say that we've got a lot of work to do in kind of telling our story across the board. And especially as it relates to something you're pointing out with pulling in data to support our overall goals and objectives, right? Where are we doing well? Where do we need to do better? And we're kind of in the middle of that process from a budgeting perspective, moving towards an outcome-based approach. So um, granted, we're early in that, but I, but I hear you um, in that there's a lot of work to do to make sure that we're, we're able to measure the impact of what we're doing from an investment standpoint. And one of those in particular, and, and definitely interested uh, in, in this metric and what, where are we recovering costs? Where are there potentially benefits to the investments we're, we're, we're making beyond kind of the more obvious outcomes? So point taken, and I, I just know that we're, we're certainly thinking about that across the city and uh, how we can do a better job in, in measuring our outcomes and our impact going forward. Great, thanks for that. And also, I'm glad about. I'm really excited about the outcome-based uh, system. We'll see where it all goes. But yeah, it seems like that's a really positive direction. So thanks for that, and thanks for visiting. And please come again. Tila, did you have um, a question or comment? I do indeed. Thank you. I am definitely looking at the last year's and next year's and previous year's budget. And honestly, in my tenure on TAB, I have recognized that that's probably one of the most impactful things that we as a board can do is advise staff about what money they seek, what money they plan for, what money they plan to spend it on. Um, and I, I, I honestly think this is one of the more impactful things we can do. Um, I'm also mindful recently about sort of the national and statewide and regional impact of traffic violence. And I have been looking up, for instance, recently, how many people perish in fires 
um, versus how many people perish in <laughs> uh, Parks and Rec. Um, and I am struck that we are spending, you know, 40000 this next year, maybe 28000 two years ago, 55000 on fire rescue to avert maybe four deaths like we have we we have it's a similar kind of like lightning strike death situation however the numbers of people who are killed and maimed or seriously injured on our roads are far more like dwarfed the numbers and the risks um per thousand people, hundred thousand people, ten thousand people, um that are killed and maimed on our highways. And I'm really struck that we don't have a robust system other than some verbal wishy-washy commitment to vision zero that we are not achieving and we have not been achieving. If we dedicated the amount of resources that we do to fire and rescue and parks and rec um, or community vitality that we do to the fire department, I honestly think we might be able to stem some of the carnage and uh, serious injuries we're see seeing on our roads. And so I would really love, and I've been talking to the last several um, heads of transportation and mobility to ask for far more resources um, and far more robust programs for stemming particularly speed-related injuries, but Injuries and deaths on our roadways in our city and on our county roads. And I think this is an opportunity to really treat this like the public health emergency that we thought that COVID was, that, that COVID really was. So I am um, underwhelmed in how much this budget tracks, last year's budget tracks, the previous budget. We're really making almost incremental improvements for a what I consider a public health crisis. And I would really like a more public reconciliation and recognition of our road violence, traffic violence problem here in the city, in the county, in the state. And I would love for Boulder to lead the way in stemming that problem. I'll just say, you know, thanks, Tila, and definitely hear you. Um, I think, you know, we, the one thing that comes to mind is the um, Safe Streets and Roads for All application that we submitted, kind of being that really big uh, breaking the status quo, right, as far as investment goes. Um, and, you know, who knows if we're going to be awarded that, but I think um, that was a step in the right direction as, as far as trying to make an effort to kind of break the mold. Um, and certainly there's opportunity to think about how we can do more. Um, but I think that kind of comes to mind as one, one step in the right direction and we'll see if we're successful in that. For real, Natalie, if if you were as important as the fire department, you would have a lot more money available to do some some real change around town. And I've I've I, you know I've talked to the last four or six directors about this, and I have faith in you. And I would like you to try to go to bat to treat this as the public health crisis it is. Well, 
I just add um, here it makes me think of our our um, retreat item to work on. One of them was for Tab to work on. I think Alex and Trini are looking at this to work on. You know what additional funding sources can we put forth as a board to council um, to help support you know and accelerate our our movement towards our transportation goals. So, I mean, I just I think we can be. Um, definitely participants and supporters and advocates on that um, to help to help move that forward. So um, anyway, so I look forward to that as we move along with our um, with those retreat priorities and particularly that that funding piece as well. Becky, can I just add one thing? That, yeah, I, yeah. I hesitate, I hesitate to try because Tila, that was that was uh, very well said, and I agree with it. Um, I just wanted to to track to the budget discussion and think, um, you know, this is when I hear you talk like I what I think about is like this is less about a transportation problem and this is about a problem for the whole city. And so in the context of a, a city budget, um, if we look at a bar chart of deaths of deaths and maimings that transportation is 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 is, is high. I mean, I like to see the data. I think that to me, that was part of the point is like it, if we had in our budget. A, a, I don't know if it's a pie chart, it's a, a bar chart or whatever, but but showed wh where are people dying in the city, and or I guess in which ways are people dying, and then and then how would you allocate those deaths and injuries to departments? It would probably jump out that there are a few departments that are that are being under under resourced compared to the rest, and this is of course one of these things that that is um, people have learned to just not see it because it's a steady drip that just keeps happening and you know we we're, we're more interested in unusual deaths um so i think this is this is a call in part for to the budget office and and thinking about how, how we present overall the data of like what, what are we getting for the things we're spending and we're getting a lot of deaths and they do come from you know some some places so um anyway thanks for raising that tila thanks ryan and I just want to add that it is a national crisis. It's not just regional. Absolutely, Trini. And that was kind um, of my one like 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 flag about what Ryan said. Yeah. And this is kind of where I'm I'm coming from in general in my work these days. But it's it's a national health crisis. And Trini, you know that better than anybody. It is yep. not up to the city or the state like we are ill-equipped to address it but until we start sounding the alarm no one's going to step up i do think that there is additional funding and that we are in a place that maybe i'm very romantic about it but but i do see that there are things being done at a federal level and it's starting to like trickle down and those that funding is starting to become available i think this is the second year for that um grant that natalie was speaking to which is the safe streets for all and you know the national roadway safety strategy was announced last year and with it came five billion additional dollars exclusively for complete streets so the funding's there it's just kind of you know <laughs> tapping into it and realizing that yeah that this is a crisis and that we can't continue to allow people to die because we know how to fix things we have the resources potentially and it's just reaching out to the right people but yeah and i think natalie and her team are doing a really really good job but perhaps yes we have to prioritize to the city that this is what we need to put money behind or more money behind right so yeah thank you for that i appreciate it and thank you for bringing it up Uh, I see a, a few hands up here, but I don't, I don't know if any of you have any more um, comments. Um, and I know we are um, running behind, so I don't want to uh, cut anybody off. But if if we're good here, then we maybe move on to the last item under matters under staff. Yep. Thank you, Mark and uh, Garrett on that one. Thanks, Mark. Okay, we do have 
just a actually very brief update. I just wanted to make sure you all had a chance to provide feedback through the survey from HRQ around board and commission evaluation, the program evaluation that council, um, it's really a council led initiative. Uh, obviously we have consultants working on it, um, but hopefully you all got that message and had a chance to provide some feedback. Okay. Or at least a few of you did. <laughs> Okay. Natalie, I think I did, yes. but I don't know how to confirm whether I did. Uh, we can probably get a head count on that. Um, I imagine the consultant on their end is probably tabulating who they're getting feedback from. So we can confirm. Well, if, if, if I didn't give feedback, it's not because I didn't care. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I did it, but I, I might not have like successfully submitted it. Okay. Well, I actually have a meeting with the consultant, I think next week or something. So there will be a chance for me to kind of check in on that. And could we have access to the document again, please? Um, I'm not sure about that. I can look into it and see if it can be made available again. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, and then just one final thing to note and acknowledge, we did see staff received a message from Community Cycles just shortly before this meeting about Grandview. Um, we have not had time to really kind of fully dive into what was addressed in there, uh, but we'll be following up and probably doing a field assessment or something to kind of see what's going on. Um, and we'd be happy to kind of report back when we meet again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you, all Natalie. We have from staff. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, so uh, we have matters from the board. Ryan, I know you had an item for us. Yeah, I can go unless you want. I know you. I think you might have something to do, Becky. Either either order is fine with me. Right. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Same go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I sent an email earlier today to to tab members, um, Tr Trini and Tila. Did you? Can you raise your hand or tell me if you saw that or know what I'm talking about? Okay, Tila. Yeah, yeah I saw it. Okay, oh, great. Okay, so you saw it. Okay, so um, just, uh, I guess for the benefit of so for everybody here, so um, I'm just following up on uh, at our last meeting I had planned. We, we had discussed uh, my sending an email or a correspondence to city council to as a kind of companion to the minutes from our July meeting in which we voted to, um, as, as part of the East Aurora neighborhood parking permit matter, um, also tell council we think that um, city code is standing in the way of being able to do more uh, on parking, standing in the way of us being able to do more on our um, transportation goals that we care about. So I sent a, um, a draft email, or sorry, a draft of the memo today that you, that you all have that we could look at in a moment, um, if, if that makes sense. But before I do that, I'll just say that I, I think the, the process is, uh, is such that I, um, if there's any feedback today, so, so we can get it to a point where we agree that it should go, go forward, then I think the, um, the, the next step would be to um, wait until the council uh, has the minutes from July on their agenda. And I don't know the exact which week it's coming, which week it'll be, but I know that the June minutes the tab just went to council last week. So it is presumably within the next few weeks. I know there's other things coming with parking to, to council. Um, and I had previously imagined sending it to sending it to council just sort of more more quickly. But I think um, it works better to send it along with the minutes that they're getting so that it, it's a highlight for those minutes. Um, so maybe the first thing to say is, are there any thoughts or questions on the sort of like process and what we should do? And then secondly, does anybody want to weigh in on the um, text, which, which, I could, which I could pull up? So step one, process where we are. Any thoughts or questions on that? Okay. Uh, and I just would say I didn't I didn't know there like that timing. So it's it's useful to hear that. Thanks for doing that digging. Okay. I didn't I sort of figured it out, but yeah, okay. And um great. And I should clarify, Becky has weighed in on this. So that we could just as well call this from Ryan and Becky. Um and then also um 
Kurt from the planning board gave some technical advice on this. So, um, so uh, I guess the other maybe sort of like sub like one one B on this is I know there's some other parking things we're talking about too that Becky's going to present. So I, I I think this is the right way to go and just to keep it kind of attached to the minutes um, and not try to get too I try to I don't know um, integrate more than that. But I'm, my mind's open if like anybody wants to do something else. So just maybe you could, like going once, going twice. Anything, <laughs> anything else on process or does that sound good to just Okay. Um, then the second question is, does anybody want to call up the actual document and make any edits or you see the document now and would you like to suggest edits to it um, or anything along the lines of revision? And if not, I'm happy to just take a nod or hands or vote. I, need a, I need a momentito to look at it again. Thank you. Also, I just closed that window. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> hey, Brian. Well, um, feels um, like I, I I do just want to and Meredith jump in here too if uh, if I get something wrong. Um, we had some like just technical glitches when we tried to put in the minutes from the July meeting into council's packet. Were you aware of that already? Okay. Um, well, anyway. We are working those out, but it was like missing, I think, a page at the end of the minutes or something. So I believe now the September 21st packet is going to have the full, is that what we're looking at, Meredith? Okay. Is going to have the full minutes included in there with like the signed page and everything. So that might matter since you're going to reference it. Um, Great. Bye. That. I guess I was I didn't realize that any anything had gone yet. I, I saw the June the June minute, the June minutes had gone. I think last week I didn't realize that a, a previous version of the July minutes had already gone. So anyway, I guess. Well, I believe we ended up. Did we end up pulling them, Meredith? Because we re we realized. Well, actually, Council Member Friend reached out to us and let us know that they were missing a page, and so once we found that out, we pulled them so that we could correct the error. When when did the first version go? Do you know? It was in the preliminary packet, I believe. Is that okay? Right, Meredith. Correct. Um, the Fine. technology would not accept the DocuSigned minutes and Alex's signatures required for them to be final minutes. Okay, got it. So it was a preliminary version. That's why I didn't see it because I was just looking on the public online stuff. Okay. Great. Um, so then I'll, yeah, then it, that sounds straightforward then. Um, okay, hang on. So we're talking about the document called Memo to City Council on Perkin in City Code from Tab. Yeah. Okay. So because it has extensive reference to the July 10 meeting that I was not at, uh, I don't think that I can sign on to it. I'm not sure how that matters. It's not that I disagree with anything that I've read here. It's just that I was not part of that discussion. Okay. Um. I am happy to re-review it once you have, you know, attained sign off or not sign off or whatever consensus from the other people who are on that meeting about this uh, letter, but I, I cannot join it because I was not there at the relevant uh, meeting that okay. you are ostensibly, you know, that you're, you're summarizing here. Okay. I think that's, I think that's fine. And I think the, um, I guess in some ways I've, I've already been given direction at the last meeting to, to go to, to send this to council. So, um, Really, this is a note saying, hey, council, you know, this explains what's in the memo. So which the minutes have already you know, been recorded for. So I don't think that's really a problem. Um, cool. And Super guess, califragilistic. Yeah. yeah. So if folks have any, you know, if members have any, just, you know, look at this and you'd like to see any changes, I guess, suggested. Otherwise, I think I have the mandate to. Uh, Trini, anything from you? No, I, I, oh, hold on. Am I muted? No. No, well, no I looked it over and it all looks good. So. Okay. Great. Thank you. And Becky, are you, you're still okay? 
All right, then I think that's that's fine. Okay, um, that's all. That's all then. Thanks everybody for your work on this. And Becky, I look forward to the next uh, item on related part. <laughs> Thank you. It looks terrific. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I will try to make this brief. Um, I emailed uh, the oh, my fellow tab members um, about uh, the retreat item related to off street parking that. Um, uh, we agreed to as one of our retreat priorities. So I'm um, really trying to get rolling on it. Um, and basically in my email, I just outlined the sort of three main points of the ask effectively for council for their work plan for next year. And I just wanted to get a, um, make sure everyone was okay with that ask as I had outlined it um, before I go to other boards and ask them to endorse that ask. So I'll just name those three components here. Um, one, so, the, so remember, this is a this is ultimately a request to council, current and but really for the next council. So that includes people who will be elected in the coming election. Um, so item one, we ask that they add an item to the 2024 work plan to revise our off street parking ordinances. Number two, requesting that they eliminate off street parking mandates from city code. And number three, that they also consider implementing off-street parking maximums and adopting a TDM ordinance to further support our parking management um, and overall goals. So those are kind of the three pieces. I'm trying to keep it simple since I will be talking to people of various other boards that don't necessarily spend as much time on parking <laughs> um, in their work. Um, but those are sort of the three pieces. And I just want to make sure that TAB you know, doesn't have any objections to them before I ask others to support them. So. You can give me feedback here or you can give me feedback via email, but I do need to kind of get rolling on talking to other boards. So please let me know within a day or two um, if you if you zero, want to. Zero, zero objection here. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tila. Um, excellent. Um, and then also just let you know the sort of boards I prioritize for outreach are planning board, Boulder Junction commissions, the housing board, environmental board, and water resources board, because I think they're sort of a, the most direct connection to off-street parking. Um, and then some of the other boards might be related, but maybe are a little more secondary in, in my mind. But if you have feelings otherwise, let me know. And and by, by secondary, I mean, I will invest less of my time in reaching out to them. Maybe send an email, but not, you know, try to do as much direct engagement versus those main boards I mentioned where I'll, I'll really try to talk to, to the members, uh, all the members of the boards. So um, that's my thinking again, open to feedback, feel free to email me or if you have a, want to have a conversation about it, let me know. But I am going to start doing that, that outreach um, throughout the course of the coming month. Becky, am I recalling that you were also asking whether um, city staff had any feedback on this effort? Um, not at this time, um, but uh, if we want to have any further conversations, um, you know, I'm yeah, of course, happy to engage. So does city um, um does city staff have any feedback on this effort? So I don't think so at this time. We did have a um I know Becky chatted with one of our staff or a couple of our staff um for a little bit just to kind of have some of the background. And um, you know, we're happy to if if there's a, a desire for us to weigh in some more, we're happy to do that. And my my thinking is that, you know, as getting this on the work plan will mean there's then you know, a good amount of time and when um, there will be, you know, some more analysis and conversation. And so we'll certainly um, want all the expertise <laughs> that that staff has, including past work done on this issue, um, to be um, included then before anything is finalized in in a change to the ordinances. Okay, thank you, Becky. I, I really like that approach. Becky, I just had one one thing to make sure we're all buttoned up here. Um, I'm really excited about this initiative and I'm ready for you to go forward, but I just wanted to um, make sure, so, you know, we have this clause in the city code for ta our TABS duties, or it says the board should not involve itself in any review under the land use legislation, blah, 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 Title IX. Um, and, I, I don't, I think, I think we have, um, 
the jurisdiction to move forward on this based on what came from our um, our our offsite. But uh, and, and relatedly, we have a we have a, a special relationship with planning board also in like our our charter. So um, I don't I guess maybe this I don't have this question for Natalie, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody feels like we're good here. I, I think that we're good here, but I just would hate to go down the road and then somebody says, hey, but tab doesn't you can't like proactively do land use stuff. So are we all feel good with this? So I guess, um, I mean, I think it'll kind of depend on just what you end up putting forward as like a recommendation to council. Um, because my understanding is that at least what you had been working on was kind of within the domain of TAB's charter, though the charter is kind of vague, but um, yeah. it seemed within that domain. And so if you plan to advise council on you know a policy issue within that domain, I think that's appropriate for the board to do. Great. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. And, and it's a great question, Ryan. I think since these reviews are, there are these reviews coming to us for site reviews for places that are asking for exceptions to the off-street parking, that seems to me that it like is further links our work to the off-street parking code if those you know reviews are coming to us already. Yeah, I'll and I'll just say, I mean, I think this is the type of um, feedback and just like helpful information for HRQ as they're doing the boards and commission kind of program update because I think these are the types of questions that are in that gray area right now that seem there seems to be a need for a little bit more clarity about um, boards rules and responsibilities in these areas. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so I didn't mean to complicate anything. I think I think it's pretty straightforward that we're, yeah, we're, we're inbounds. And also this came from our um, our, our offsite and um, I think it's a straightforward consequence of that. So it's great, fully supportive. Thanks. Um, any other matters from the board? Okay. Um, then I think we are on to future agenda topics. Um, October, that includes, do I, am I supposed to read this or is this, is this you, Natalie? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm happy to, <laughs> it kind of, Alex usually, I think, does it, but oh. we have a couple <laughs> items scheduled um, at this point, but we'll have we'll have um, probably more to add to that, and we'll go over that at agenda setting in a week or so. Great. Um, great. Sounds good. So we'll have an um, update on the snow and ice program that is on the list, um, but more to come. Um, and that is the end of our agenda. Thank you, everyone, for helping me uh, chair in this meeting. Um, and I will ask, is there a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. I, I second. second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Great. Um, so that is unanimous um, with four votes. So we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Well done, Becky. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Becky. Well done.